Okay, where am I? Here I am. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. I can hear you, Howard. Yes, indeed. Okay. Um, so, panelists. <clears throat> oh, Ken, that's a brilliant background. I didn't see that. Okay. So for those on the line, me, Mark, and Howard are going to be going through setting a number of permissions and different things like that. So just bear with us for a few minutes. Yeah. Hey, Barbara. Hi, Howard. Hi, hi, Christian. <laughs> okay, it looks like chat is correctly set up. Is right now. Okay, I would think muting folks first might be good. <laughs> six, seven, seven. The, um, when people six, are six, six, zero, zero, and the Spanish one is two, one, two. I'm not sure where that is coming from. Okay. Uh, Hello. Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay. So are Howard and I now co-hosts? I don't think I, I don't think I am I unmuted? Yes. Howard, you can see if you're looking at a picture of yourself and it says your name, if you like move your mouse, if you're muted, it'll show a little red microphone with like a slash through it and that means you're muted. But if you uh -oh. just see your name, it means we can hear you. Got it. Oh, so I see everyone has the, um, the red microphone except for, uh, well, Mark has a red microphone. He does. <laughs> we can't hear you, Mark. Oh, you have that power over me. That's uh, um, something to be. Uh, so I, I didn't see a note that Howard and I were promoted from panelists to co-host. Did you already make that change? Yep. That's why okay. you could. That's why you could mute me. Interesting. Okay. Okay. Um, well, if you guys are ready, we can let the uh, the attendees in. Um, did we? There were the other list of things from Rich's list of before broadcast starts. Which yep, we're I, all set with those. We're all set with all of those. Okay. Yep. We're live on YouTube, and uh, as soon as we go uh, broadcast, then we will um, we'll, we'll be automatically recording, I believe. Okay. Okay. Here um, we go. Yep, recording is automatic. Um, Hey, Rich. Hey. <clears throat> okay. We have. Who is the uh, presenter for Revel or Revel or? Uh, so there's two, and I, um, uh, Carol attendees, and she's not on yet for the attendees, um, and Lauren. I can introduce them. I know their titles and stuff. Um, okay, great. And they yeah, are not um, there yet. Um, <laughs> I just realized I may not have invited them to be panelists. So when they get into the meeting, we'll have to promote them. I, I told them to register using the link that would have them as attendees and told them that we would promote them and change their permissions as soon as they join. So I've been looking for them, but they're not on yet. All right, I'm promoting Colleen. Yep. To panelist. And I see Cindy Cardinal Cindy. too. Michelle Parker. I don't see her, but if you see her, go ahead. Um, she's actually already a panelist. She just doesn't have video enabled, but she's already okay. listed under panelist. So she has permission to use video okay. if she is on Very a good. computer or chooses to. Hi, Colleen. Thanks for joining. We have folks muted for now, but we see you. Richard, um, uh, your name appears as Mark Diller. <clears throat> I just fixed that. Okay. I hope. Yep. 
There's Roberta. Oh, Roberta's got a cool background. So does Doug. <laughs> Doug, I was really, I, I was used to seeing your very cool pots and pans. Hey, everyone. Hey, Elizabeth. Other oh, funny backgrounds. Share it another time. So Jose is actually doing a um, a Zoom right now with um, Nicole Gelinas from the Manhattan Institute and uh, uh, about uh, the Second Avenue subway and other mm -hmm. transit issues, which is really interesting. So amazing what a difference a month makes in terms of people using Zoom for things. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to turn into a verb and an adjective and, you know. Yeah. You're going to miss us, Mark, when we're all we're doing is zooming, even when things come back. <laughs> so. uh, I suppose that's true, although there's a hint in that that makes me think I'm I'm going away somewhere. No, yeah, you're just going to miss the, uh, you know, I think it's going to change the whole nature of how people work, all of us in this city. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think it is. Our rebel speakers have not yet joined. Okay. The 7 p.m. cheer has started. Yay. <laughs> so I've been in touch with several of the boards who have been using Zoom for their full board now, uh, comparing notes and so forth. And two of them ha were um, inspired to pause at seven o'clock so that their participants could take part in the cheer. Mm -hmm which is happening right now outside my window. Yep. Yeah, bravo. I think we should do that. Next full board meeting for sure. And as you guys want for, for committee meetings. Our rebel guests still haven't joined. I'm going to shoot them an email and just see if they're having issues. They haven't emailed me anything, but challenges. I just went outside to, to or went to the window to make noise. Let's see to be as Meg, have the people from Revel showed up? I don't see them. No, not yet. I just sent them an email. Um, do you think I, chatted, I chatted with one of them earlier this morning. We could get started otherwise. I think, okay. you know, there are community members who are waiting, so. Great, well, welcome. Um, um, hopefully we'll get to meet in person at some point, but in any event, we're here on Zoom. This is um, the Transportation Committee of Manhattan Com Community Board 7. I'm here with my co-chair, uh, Meg Schmidt, um, as well as a whole host of um, community board members because it's a joint committee meeting. Um, Mark Diller, who's the chair of the um, community board is, is here as well. And um, there is going to be a presentation from Revel that has um, a, an electric um, scooter program uh, okay. that's been rolled out. Oh, they're here? How are you? There's other committees represented as well tonight. Okay, um, do you want to, um, I'm, I'm just not sure who is here from them. Mark, do you have that information? Yeah. Well, the, the other two committees are the uh, BCI committee, the Business and Consumer Issues Committee, and the Health and Human Services Committee. Um, some of the, I think William has got uh, on, at least on two of those committees, 
Um, so, but that doesn't mean you get two votes, I'm sorry to say. Um, and um, the, uh, uh, and uh, folks, when they speak, can identify themselves as to which committee they're on or where they're speaking. And in addition, while Howard was starting interruptions, one of our uh, guests from Revel, Lauren Briens, who's their general manager for their New York City uh, operations, has joined us and I am promoted Lauren to a panelist. So um, I don't, I'm taking another look. Lauren has a colleague named Carol who has not yet joined. Um, so Lauren, are you comfortable if we proceed with that agenda item? Actually, Meg, before you do that, I see someone named Julianne Cuba has her hand up in attendees and I'm not sure what that's about. So maybe if it has, if it is something to do with us, why don't we uh, find out? I think she's just wondering if she's like visible to people. She posted in the chat as well. Okay. Okay. I believe the attendee setting does not have video. That's right. But if she That's wants correct. to speak and be seen, then we can always promote her. So, um, so, so good to use the um, the raise hands function. And when you want to speak, the chairs will recognize you. I'm here just as backup. She said she was okay. She didn't want to speak. Yeah, she's in chat. She said it's fine. Very good. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, then uh, we'll make sure that Lauren Friens from uh, Rebel is able to speak. Rebel is a shared electric moped company, not, not scooters, mopeds, they're distinct, um, and reached out to the district office a couple weeks ago. They've been operating in Brooklyn and other cities in the U.S. but have been operating in Brooklyn and recently started a program on the Upper West Side. So their staff reached out to the district office and we wanted to have them here for an informational presentation. I'll note I haven't seen them driving on the street yet personally, though I did see one parked on my block the other night. So that was interesting. Um, and Lauren, I see you nodding. Um, we do have your slides and Mark, are you doing the share screen or will Whenever you be doing ready. the share screen? Whenever you're Lauren, ready. Yeah, Lauren, sure. We, great. And just tell us when to advance to next. Okay, we'll do. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me tonight. Um, Carol, my community affairs manager, might kind of join us um, in the middle. Uh, she is, uh, we're kind of doing double duty tonight. We had another community board <laughs> before this one. Um, but yeah, we're really, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I actually grew up on the Upper West Side. So um, the community is really close and dear to my heart. A um, little bit about the company, kind of the background. So Revel was launched uh, in, in 2018, actually, in a small community in Brooklyn. Um, our two co-founders, New Yorkers, uh, had traveled around, seen mopeds, seen electric shared mopeds in other countries, and thought, you know, why doesn't this exist in New York? Um, if I want to get from, from Williamsburg to Park Slope, it's torture. Um, wouldn't it be nice if I had a moped? And so they started with a very small pilot. Um, it worked pretty well. Uh, and then in June of 2019, we expanded in a much bigger way with a thousand mopeds um, from Astoria in Queens down to Sunset Park in Brooklyn um, and out from Bed-Stuy into, uh, into Red Hook. Um, and, and yeah, so I'll, I'll try to talk through in the presentation as we go, how we ended up in your community in particular um, and a little bit more about the vehicle as itself. So um, next slide. So as, as Meg mentioned, uh, it's not a scooter. It's not an e-bike. Um, it's not a unicycle, <laughs> it is a moped. Uh, and with that, it is um, registered under the DMV, um, under New York State. Uh, and New York State kind of defines all of the requirements it must meet. Um, so the fact that it has two mirrors and it has blinkers and a horn, um, it has a license plate as well. And so all of that is kind of regulated under New York State, um, which is why we're, we're legally allowed to operate in this city. Um, and it also requires a driver's license to operate. So an important thing to note about Rebels is that they are, uh, they operate in the street. So they're driving with traffic, with cars. Um, it is a motor vehicle. It's not in a bike lane. It's not on a sidewalk. Uh, it is with cars. Um, which is why it has blinkers and lights and all of that sort of stuff um, and a license plate. It, uh, it also parks, um, it's a free floating system. So unlike kind of city bike, which has a docking system or, or zip car, which has reserved parking, it's all free floating. Um, you'll see them kind of parked between two cars. 
Uh, they take up about three feet of dead space, um, or you'll see them kind of between the crosswalk and the first car. Um, but they, they fit in pretty seamlessly um, throughout the communities that we're operating in. Um, and you'll see them as you walk around. Uh, generally, they're parked well. If they're not, um, there is a customer support phone number right there underneath the dash. Uh, please call us. We will come fix it. We have a whole team of people um, dedicated to that. We call them Rebel Rangers. Uh, and so they will actually fix bad parking jobs um, or if it's obstructing something. Um, we, the service itself is generally cheaper than uh, rideshare services, depending on how far you go. Uh, so it's a dollar to unlock and then 31 cents per minute. Um, but we're seeing kind of like an average trip is somewhere between five and seven dollars. Um, uh, and that would be for like a 20 minute ride. Um, so that's, that's pretty decent. Um, it's also 100% electric. So they're battery powered. We swap the batteries. Um, and that means that they're quiet and they don't have any emissions, which I think is really positive. Uh, next slide. So we do some screening of our, of our drivers, of our users. Um, we wanna make sure that we have kind of a responsible user base that are using the service. And so drivers have to be 21 years of old, uh, sorry, 21 years of age um, with a valid driver's license. Um, we also screen kind of a driving history uh, to make sure that you don't have uh, DUIs or excessive speeding tickets. Um, each Revel comes with two Department of Transportation certified helmets um, in the helmet case. You can kind of see it a little bit on the back of this photo, but there, um, there are other photos where I'll show you. Uh, two helmets kind of nestle in there um, and they are mandatory. If people don't wear them, um, we will suspend them uh, and or fine them as well. So we, we kind of keep those rules. Um, we, we take them very seriously and we enforce them. Um, as I mentioned, you know, they travel with traffic. Um, each revel is, uh, each ride is covered by insurance, uh, third party liability insurance. So it's not an add or an addition, it's that ride itself is covered. Um, and the mopeds themselves don't go faster than 30 miles an hour um, or 29 miles an hour, technically. So no matter how hard you tried um, going downhill at full speed, uh, it will break. You will not go faster than 29 miles an hour. Um, and so that's just fast enough to keep up with city traffic. Um, and uh, yeah, next slide. So these are kind of screenshots of the app itself. Um, so you'll see kind of on the left-hand side, uh, when you kind of open the app and kind of zoom out, that's what you'll see. Those, are, those dots are all little revels. Um, the kind of highlighted area is what we call our zone. Um, what that really means is a parking map. So that's where you can end or start your ride. Um, but if you wanted to go outside of that area, you can, um, you just have to pause your ride. So you can't end your ride, you know, at JFK, but if for whatever reason you wanted to drive to JFK on a moped, you could, um, you would just pause it and then bring it back when you're done. Um, so when you open the app, it'll show you kind of where you are and, and how far it is for you to walk to the next closest moped. Um, so ideally it's within three to five minutes of, of where you are, um, if we have the right density, correct. And then you can just reserve it. You can reserve it for 15 minutes and then you can start your ride, um, after that. Next slide. So, um, our latest kind of launch in Brooklyn and Queens in 2019, um, you know, it honestly surpassed all of our expectations. It really filled a need, uh, people, I think um, in the boroughs, uh, a lot of the subways were designed, you know, 100 years ago. They're all kind of designed to go into Manhattan, um, and in Manhattan, they're all going north-south. So there's a big there's a big issue with kind of east-west traffic or inter inter neighborhood connectivity. Um, it's just not kind of service. And then of course there's transit deserts which don't have public transit at all. Um, and so we really kind of fit into that niche. And so we saw tens of thousands of people sign up um, within the first month. Um, and then since then, we've seen over 3 million miles. Uh, and then we've been lucky enough to kind of expand into other cities uh, across the US. So we're now in um, DC, Miami, Oakland, and uh, Oakland, California, and Austin as well. Um, and this kind of screenshot in the middle is um, a photo of, of a proclamation we got from Speaker Corey Johnson uh, welcoming us to the city when we launched here. It's like a green transportation option. Next slide. Um, so from the beginning, um, we decided that we wanted to be a company that uh, 
was actually serving the communities um, and the community members in our cities. And so from the beginning, we, we launched an access program. Um, so any members who are on public assistance, federal, state, um, or local uh, can apply to us to get 40% off all of their rides. Um, so to date, we've saved people over $100,000 on that in New York City. Um, and that's something we're really proud of. We um, kind of mid-March, uh, well, actually probably even early March at this point in time, um, when coronavirus became a thing in our city, uh, we decided as a company that we wanted to, to do our part to help because we're a transportation option and that is essential. And so we made our service free for all healthcare workers. Um, and that's still to this day going on. So if you know of anyone, um, there's a form on our website. They literally just have to put in their name, their position, their hospital, um, or whatever medical institution they work at. Um, and our customer support will convert their account into a free account. Um, next slide. So that goes to a little bit of, of how we kind of ended up in Manhattan um, on such short notice. Um, part of that was uh, actually the majority of it was that we, we launched this program free for healthcare workers in Brooklyn and in Queens, and we expanded that zone to encompass some major hospitals. Um, and that was received really positively by the community. And then a couple of days later, people started reaching out hey, what about me? I'm in Manhattan. What about our hospitals in Manhattan? Um, there's obviously a huge demand and huge need there as well um, because the Revel will allow you to kind of travel in isolation, which the subway cannot guarantee you. And so we decided as a company, um, hey, you know, we think we can make this work. Um, so we launched Manhattan uh, with support of local community members. Um, at, well, I should say, sorry, council members um, at the city council. And so we are north of 65th Street um, all the way up into Washington Heights and Inwood um, with kind of a smaller area uh, in Murray Hill, Kipps Bay, which covers a bunch of hospitals there. Um, and then also uh, around the Javits Center and, uh, and Chelsea as well. Um, so that's, that's how we ended up in, in the Upper West Side as well. Uh, next slide. So the next couple of slides kind of go into like us as a company and who we are. Um, so you get to know us a little bit. Uh, so from, from the beginning, our co-founders were really adamant that because we're using a public right of way, um, we're, not, we're not disrupting anything. We're trying to be as seamless and as integrated as possible. And that means working with the people who, um, who are the voice of the communities. And so we're really active with um, council members, with participating in events with them, um, with meeting with them, uh, with NYPD as well. Um, NYPD in particular, those relationships are really important uh, because they need to understand um, that these, uh, because they're, that, well, sorry, they need to understand that these are motor vehicles and that they can enforce the rules of the road, um, which is oftentimes really challenging for them to enforce with all these different modes of transportation because they don't know what the rules are and what, what, you know, what applies and what doesn't apply. It's really hard to understand, you know, what's a, a throttle assist versus a pedal assist versus whatever. Um, but these mopeds have a license plate, and so we're really active, making sure that all all the um, officers know that and understand that, um, and also can work really closely with us if there's any ever any issues. Um, the Rebel Rangers program, as I also mentioned earlier, um, that's us just out in the community constantly, making sure that mopeds are actually parked legally. Uh, we do a lot of awareness for our users, but you always get new users. Um, and so they might not know, but uh, before you start every ride, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, we instituted a new, a new kind of pop-up in the app that reminds you, you know, what is legal parking for a moped, um, you know, alternate side parking, meters are excluded, all of that um, is now kind of front and center when you start your ride. Uh, next slide. So um, our company does not use gig economy. Uh, something we're really proud of. Uh, we kind of built our business model from the beginning with an eye towards trying to support um, like real wages, uh, real healthcare benefits, paid vacation, um, paid sick leave, all of those things. We also, um, on our operations side, uh, do a lot of kind of training in electric vehicle technology because it's not like there's a whole workforce of people who understand electric mopeds. Um, and so we do all of that training in-house and we've got some partnerships um, with kind of local uh, workforce development organizations in that realm as well. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so motor vehicle, obviously safety is super critical, super important to us. Um, so that's why to repeat again, two helmet, uh, two helmets in every helmet case. Um, the reason that there's two is that there's a bigger one and a smaller one. Um, and also you're allowed to have a second rider on the back as well as a passenger. Um, we also, this is unfortunately paused right now, um, but we, we do offer lessons seven days a week out of our headquarters in Gowanus, um, but that's, you know, not everyone wants to go to Gowanus. And so we also do pop-ups um, uh, pretty much every weekend when the weather is nice in different communities around the city. Um, and people can kind of sign up online for those, for those lessons. Uh, next slide. So that's pretty much the presentation. Um, this is a good kind of close up of the helmet case that I was talking about earlier. Um, but as I mentioned, you know, support numbers there or support emails there. Um, you know, this isn't, this isn't a call center in some foreign country. This is um, folks sitting in Brooklyn. Um, we're there 24 seven. We will answer your calls. We will answer your emails. Um, so if there's ever any issues or concerns, like please let us know. Um, we'll respond much faster than 311 or whatever um, because we care a lot about our reputation in the community. Uh, so that's it. So I can take some questions. Thank you, Lauren, for joining us and for giving us that overview and for reaching out in the first place. Um, we do have some hands raised by some uh, various uh, committee members. So I see Elizabeth who's been waiting for a long time. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to Elizabeth. Sure, thanks. And thanks, Lauren. This was really interesting and um, a great presentation. We've seen a lot of revels in the neighborhood uh, in recent weeks. Um, we've seen them parked on side streets. Um, my question for you is about the data. Um, who is using them on the Upper West Side? Um, I'm assuming you have that information. Who is using them for what purposes? And then um, also have a question about the um, you know, those who need transit the most right now, many of whom do not have credit cards and are, un are unbanked. So how do you propose, I know you have a proposal that you mentioned at the beginning of your presentation about helping those who are in poverty. Um, how are you addressing that? Those are my two questions, thanks. Yeah, those are good questions. Um, so, so right now the majority of our users um, in Manhattan are under that healthcare program or there are other essential workers that need to travel uh, for free, I'm sorry. There are other essential workers that need to travel um, and leave their homes uh, for work because it's considered essential. So um, something that I neglected to mention earlier and, and maybe Carol who's now joined us can talk about it. Um, but we recently just, I think it's today, we've, we've announced a, an additional program uh, for, for restaurants. So Carol, do you wanna talk about that briefly? Hi everyone, my name is Carol Antunes. I'm the community affairs manager. I am so, so sorry I am late. Uh, we were on another call earlier. Um, yeah, so we also, aside from the healthcare uh, mm. workers program, we do have local partnerships for restaurants. So we we know right now that local restaurants are really hurting. They're either doing takeout only or delivery only models. And a lot of them just didn't have the infrastructure to really carry out those deliveries. So we've been reaching out just on, on an individual basis, one-on-one -on -one, calling them up, emailing them and letting them know, hey, we know what you're going through. We're going to offer a four week uh, membership totally free so they can sign up their employees to do the delivery. So that's another way that we're trying to just work locally with our communities because we know those people need to go to work. Like what is New York without takeout? So that's just another are way. Are you working with like Uber Eats and DoorDash? And those we are not. Or not. So, um, we wanted to help restaurants keep okay. As much as they want so those services traditionally take anywhere from 25 to 30 percent uh, so we kind of we didn't want to follow that model so the program is totally free and it allows the restaurant okay. to kind of decide what structure how to structure their takeout uh, del and delivery business thank you thanks yeah and to just go back to elizabeth to your earlier question about the unbanked um, I, we don't have a good answer to this right now. Um, this is a challenge that a lot of app-based companies have is that you need credit cards to kind of verify um, and to prevent fraud. Uh, and so it's honestly, it's something that we're working on. Um, we don't have an answer for it right now. Uh, there are maybe some potential solutions with like prepaid or other types of, of third-party apps that are coming out that will allow someone who is unbanked um, to use a credit card uh, in a way that also minimizes fraud. Um, but it's honestly, it's a huge challenge for app-based companies across the country. 
Um, so, and it's, it's a big problem for us too, because like, honestly, we don't want that to be a barrier for people, but we don't have an answer right now. Understood. Um, we've been talking about this a lot on the board. So thank you very much. Yeah. You. If you have any suggestions, like, please let us know. <laughs> Happy to follow up off the line. Okay, the second hand I saw go up right after Elizabeth's a while back was Ken Coughlin. So I'm going to lower his hand, but Ken, please fire away. Okay. Um, thank you for your revelatory presentation. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I'm all in favor of uh, uh, any uh, much lighter and greener alternative to the automobile. Um, and I think, think this is that. Um, the concern that I have um, is about um, the training of riders. Um, I have, um, uh, I, uh, I don't know how much it weighs, but I imagine it's somewhere between about a hundred pounds or so, maybe a little bit more. Um, it's capable of going on almost 30 miles an hour. And uh, so it could do a lot of damage to a pedestrian or a, or a cyclist. And in fact, last year in Williamsburg, uh, one of your riders hit a cyclist and fractured his, well, allegedly, he hit a cyclist and fractured his ankle. And there, was, there is a lawsuit, or at least there was. Um, and, uh, you know, right now you've suspended the optional training. Um, and so uh, um, I'm wondering uh, what you're doing in lieu of that. Or are there any videos that people can watch? Um, I understand that the, uh, um, that the uh, throttle has something of a hair trigger. And there was a reporter from Streets Blog who took a ride on one last year and almost hit the, uh, the instructor. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so, you know, we have, a, uh, you have potentially, you know, thousands of, uh, inexperienced riders getting on one for the first time and not really knowing what they're doing. And I think that's concerning. Yeah, I totally understand your concern, Ken. Um, we, this is part of why we go through the screening cross process for drivers. So they have to have a driver's license that is valid. So they understand the rules of the road. Um, to drive a moped, you need to understand kind of the basics of, of, uh, of, of kind of bipedal balance. Um, that's not the right term, but, you know, having kind of like this lateral balance, um, the same thing that you would use for, for a bicycle. Um, and so we as a company believe it's pretty accessible to new users, but um, that, that doesn't mean that we are kind of wash of our obligation to make sure people understand what they're doing. And so, yes, the lessons are optional. Um, we're working right now on on, um, on sh well, we're going to be working on shooting kind of a long form lesson video, um, but there are quite a few videos online right now that will walk people through the basics of the moped. Um, but we want to do kind of like a, a live um, lesson video as well. So we're working on that. Um, and ideally um, within the next couple of weeks, um, I'm hoping I'd have to check in with our engineering team, but those kinds of um, watching those videos will become mandatory. Uh, so that's something that we're working on as well. Um, that, but yeah, that's yeah. good. What what does a, a clean driving record mean for you? Yeah, so it's things like uh, you know no uh, DUIs in the last five years, um, excessive speeding, you know thirty miles over the speed limit, um, things like that. Thirty miles over the speed limit. Yeah, excessive speeding. I believe. So if if they went fifty miles an hour in a twenty five mile an hour zone, that's okay. You know, I, I, it's it's kind of like it's the same third party company that um, a lot of uh, companies will use to kind of verify drivers for their services. Um, and we're kind of like choosing the, the it's like a similar process to, to what verifies for an Uber driver versus a Lyft driver for whatever. It's like a very similar process. That's it for me for now. Okay, thanks. I'm going to call on Robert SBA, who's also been waiting for a long time. Robert? Uh, yeah, let me unmute. Okay, good. I just, you, yeah. No? Okay. Uh, I think this is terrific, and it sounds like the thing for me. I tried city, uh, city, city bike, and unfortunately, that old maxim that you never forget how to ride a bike, well, guess what? And uh, I was falling all over the place, which caused some very serious problems for me. But in any event, this I like. 
And this is what I'm accustomed to in the very few places I've been to overseas, like Barcelona, where all you have is scooters. This is not a scooter, but it's the same concept. You have less than a car. And that's the only way you can really get around because of the congestion and the small streets, the call them the callejones and so on. My, my question is on your planning, and I'm sure that uh, it's significant part of your planning, and I may have missed it in your presentation on the porting, because uh, city bike is all over the place and we're always running into community parking uh, needs and city bike ports and NYPD is in certain places, at least around the uh, uh, Time Warner Center, uh, they need parking and they compete there with other bicycle facilities as well. Uh, is, is, your, is your porting plan uh, one of co-location with other services or uh, how's, how does porting work? And uh, because the, the advantage in when I was using City bike is that there was a port within a few blocks of me where I live. And uh, what's the distribution, let's say over the next year, uh, what is the location of your ports? Uh, I hope the answer is not that they have to come back to the takeout port because that can be quite an inconvenience. So what's the what's the deal there? Yeah, so they um, so they don't have ports. So they're free floating uh, and they park in any legal parking spot for 24 hours. So, um, so let's say you're driving and you decide, you know, you're going to park on, I don't know, eight, you know, 80, 88th street um, off of Columbus. Uh, you'll kind of drive down that street until you see about three feet, maybe four feet of space between two cars. Um, and you kind of back the moped up into that space at the rear wheel, uh, to the curb, similar to how you'd see motorcycles parked in the city. It's the exact same way that they're required to be parked. Um, but there is no kind of uh, docking system or port system. It's free floating. Um, and that's kind of what I think allows us to really be seamless in this city is that it's really dependent on where you want to go and where you want to travel. Um, and then let's say that you're leaving your friend's house um, and you, you want to hop on a Revel, you open the app and you find the one that's closest to you. So ideally, it's within a three to five minute walk of wherever you are. Um, and then when you drop it off, you know, you've left it for somebody else who can, who can ride it after you. So if I'm riding to East Harlem, for example, from the Upper West Side, and mm -hmm. I'm going to stay the weekend, mm -hmm. I'm parking there for the weekend and bringing it back uh, at the end of my... Uh, you don't have to bring it back. Yeah, so it's, so it's uh, once you park... Um, you're done. So you just park in a legal parking spot for 24 hours and you can leave it there. Someone else will take it. The next time you want to ride, you'll probably find a different one. Oh, I see. So, yeah. okay. So the next user will see that there's one there. We assume that there will be a demand in that way mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they pick it up. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? So uh, what's, what's the life of the electrical charge? And what if I'm driving miles. all over the place and I, and I leave it there on Friday and uh, somebody needs it on, uh, on Sunday and the charges, uh, where do they go get charged? Uh, so that's also a good question. So uh, the, the range is 65 miles, which is pretty decent. Um, and our team swaps the batteries. So the moped is dead. Um, we have kind of a back end app that alerts us that the batteries are dead um, and even probably before the batteries are dead, um, once it's parked, we actually go to that moped, we swap the batteries, now that moped is fully charged. We also do kind of a, a safety check while we're there. We make sure the mirrors are still good, the horn is still working, um, the tires are good, the, the helmets are clean. Uh, right now we're doing a very, very thorough cleaning of the entire moped as well with, with uh, kind of anti-coronavirus uh, disinfectants. Um, and so we're, we're very high touch on these mopeds. So you, you leave it, Maybe the battery is dead. Um, the next time you, you looked out your window, I'm, it would probably be charged. Well, you need to include that in your uh, narrative, in your argument, because it's very good, strong, a uh, lot of new jobs. It is, so yeah. At, uh, good jobs. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are decent jobs. So that uh, you have to add that into your narrative. Thank you. Definitely, will do. Thank you.
Thanks, Robert. Uh, we have several raised hands within the platform and a few raised hands physically. Um, community members, FYI, we are seeing your questions come through via the chat. And I'm making note of those to get to right after committee member questions. I also want to note to community members that you should be able to use a Q&A feature at the bottom of the webinar. Uh, if you are able to use that, that'll help us better uh, track your questions and when they're answered. Uh, but if you can't use that and you need to use chat, that's okay too. Um, Sarah Lind, I'm gonna call on you next and then I'll do one of the physically raised hand folks. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for coming. I, I have used um, Revels in Brooklyn and love them. Um, so I was so excited when I saw one on my block last week. Um, I think it's, a you know, I was shocked that uh, New York City doesn't have more mopeds. I've always been shocked. When you go to you know crowded European cities, they're everywhere. It's just, it, it's like a no-brainer to me. So I'm really glad uh, that this is happening. Although of course the circumstances in which you expanded to the Upper West Side are not great. But um, I'm thank you so much for what you're doing to help healthcare workers, et cetera. Um, I also just wanted to say, you know, I think one of the concerns we hear a lot is for pedestrians that do have sometimes fear of, you know, bicyclists, electric bikes, whatever. Um, I think this is a great alternative because as you pointed out, they drive like vehicles. So you know exactly what to expect. You know, they, they are in the traffic lanes. Um, I think it will actually be much, much better for pedestrians. Um, so to that point, I think it's a great option. Uh, I was wondering for payment, going back to the bankless payment issue, um, have you been in communication with Omni at all? Because they have some great plans for how they're going to be dealing with um, unbanked customers getting access to um, the MTA system uh, once Omni is all the way you know, into uh, service. Um, so I was just wondering if you've been in communication with them, if you've had any conversations with them about you know, cross platforms or anything like that. Um, yeah. Thanks. Not that I'm aware of, but it's very possible that um, kind of our engineering product team has. Um, so I can follow up on that and suggest to them if they haven't been in contact to reach out. Definitely. Thank you. Okay, Barbara, we're going to go to you. I know you've been raising your hand for a while. Um, FYI to folks physically raising your hand, if you can't find the raise hand feature, if you uh, go to the bottom of your screen where there are a couple of buttons and click on participants, the participant list should pop up and you should be able to see a raise hand feature. Uh, though if you don't, we can work between meetings to help figure that out. But in the interim, Barbara, you're unmuted. I didn't have it last time either. I don't know what happened. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but now I don't. Um, so I had a couple of, of small questions. First of all, um, the helmet idea sort of freaks me out a little bit, especially right now with coronavirus, because um, I don't know how often you clean them, but surely within 65 miles of, of, you, of use, more than one person has been on them. And that seems very unsanitary to me. Yeah, so, um, so totally understand that concern. Um, we offer kind of disposable hairnets within the, well, let me start from the beginning. Um, so every time we're at a moped, we're cleaning that moped really, really thoroughly. So we're using Lysol, we're using a, a product called Clear Gear as well. Both of them are rated, rated to, to, to kill coronavirus on contact. And so we're spraying every high touch surface of the moped, um, plus the helmet, plus the visor, plus the chin strap, plus the outside of the helmet. Um, and so um, that's kind of what we're doing on, on our part. Um, but that said, that doesn't kind of remove the, the, the kind of need for, for users themselves to take precautions. And so um, we're happy if users want to use their own helmet. Uh, DOT approved motorcycle helmet can be purchased from Amazon for 40 bucks. Um, it's not an option for everyone, um, but we are doing our part to clean them, make them as clean as possible. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. How fast do these accelerate from zero to 29? That is a good question, Barbara, and I'm not sure I actually know the answer to that one. Um, they've got some, they've got some decent acceleration on them, um, and that 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 is required to kind of make sure that you're keeping up with city traffic. All right. Um, how many are there on the Upper West Side, and how many do you have all together in the city? So there, because it's a free floating system, there isn't kind of like a count, um, you know, within a particular neighborhood, um, you know, at any given time. 
Um, but we, we've got about 1500 across, across uh, all of the boroughs right now. Okay, thank you. And where are you located? Uh, so right now I'm in my Park Slope apartment, um, but our offices are in Gowanus uh, and we have a warehouse in, in Red Hook as well. Okay, and um, um, you need our approval or, or are you here just to give us uh, a presentation about this? So we try and come to every community board just to make sure that you guys have um, a good sense of what the product is, what the company is, um, and to make sure in particular that you don't feel, uh, you don't hesitate to kind of reach out if there are any issues. Um, we'll, we'll ha we're happy to come back in a couple of months once you have more experience with the mopeds and with Rebel being in your neighborhood. Uh, we really wanna keep this dialogue open and, and make sure we're getting feedback from you and how we can improve. Maybe there's a particular street um, that we should not allow people to park on because you know it's always truck loading or something like that. Um, and we're happy to kind of make those changes to the map as we go along um, okay. and, and make sure we get that kind of dialogue going. All right, that's great. But you're not looking for a vote or our approval or anything. You don't need that. Is that correct? We're not, no. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, quick note. Um, also, uh, again, acknowledging and thanking community members who are putting Q&A questions in. We're tracking that and still the chat feature. We still have more committee members with questions. Um, I do appreciate that Rebel reached out to us. I appreciate that their expansion into the Upper West Side happened very rapidly, mostly with a focus around the health worker program and partnership with hospitals amidst COVID. Um, and that they also are legal vehicles, but I appreciate them reaching out to us to have further discussion. Um, and I'm glad that Warren was noting that we can keep the conversation going and really provide feedback. Um, mm -hmm. uh, there are other committee, oh, Howard, before we're continuing with committee member questions. Oh, I don't need to jump the queue. Uh, just a couple of questions. One of them was how many, uh, um, how many are there? Uh, I read somewhere, I read your promotional materials that the ones in Manhattan are not supposed to leave Manhattan? So that's the first question. The second question, is there an annual fee or it's only a per use fee? Yeah, so, uh, so right now we don't allow riders to drive between Manhattan uh, and Brooklyn or between Manhattan and Queens. Um, the reason being is that the, high, the, the bridges are just kind of major bridges. The speed limit is, um, it's higher than kind of your average city street. Uh, so it is technically legal, but as a company, we don't allow it. And so if someone does ride over one of the major bridges, our customer support calls them instantly and tells them that they're not allowed to do that. If they're a repeat offender, they get suspended from the service. Um, but that said, there are, um, there are some smaller bridges that you can use to go from Manhattan to the Bronx. Um, the speed limit is much lower. And so that's allowed um, as well. How many, so how many are Manhattan-based of the 1,500? Uh, it's a, it's a little less than, than 500. Okay. And the final question is, is there an annual fee or just a per use fee? It's per use fee right now. Um, we're investigating kind of memberships, um, and that kind of concept, but right now it's just a, a, a dollar to unlock and then 31 cents a minute while you're using it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there's still some committee members with hand raised for a long time, and then I'll get to those coming in through the chat. Uh, Rich Robbins, your hand was up. Go ahead. Thank you. So I have, um, I think, five or six questions, and at least three of them are good questions. Uh, the first one is, um, and I've seen it in chat as well, uh, can you tell us the number of crashes and the number of injuries? Uh, it's definitely something that's going to be asked by members of our community, um, and injuries both to riders and to pedestrians who have been struck by them. Uh, a few questions about geography. One is just how you handle balancing, which has been such an issue, especially in the Upper West Side uh, for city bike. Um, also, if there are no docks, how do you define zone? Is there a fence, a virtual fence that people can't go beyond uh, to park them? Uh, or, and how is that defined and how is that enforced? And uh, what's involved with going into new neighborhoods, which is related to that fence question. And then um, in terms of safety, see a number of concerns on uh, the chat about safety. Uh, one question I have is how do we make sure we keep them out of bike lanes and uh, things like the bike route on um, along the, high, uh, the river. And then also if people see someone riding irresponsibly, whether it's on the sidewalk or the wrong way or in a bike lane or otherwise, is there a way that people can see the number of the bike 
and report it to you and what actions will you take? And is that something you have taken actions uh, against people in New York City for riding irresponsibly? Yeah, um, all good questions. Honestly, we suspend people all the time. Um, and we want, <laughs> we, it's, it's just a fact of life. It's like, if you can't follow the rules, you can't use the service. Um, our reputation as a company is really important to us. And if people are riding in bike lanes or riding on sidewalks, um, then they don't deserve to be part of the service. And so um, we suspend them. Um, it, it depends kind of on, on, on what, the, what the incident is, um, what it involves, um, but we may also find them a safety violation fee as well. Um, and so uh, we're very active. And so it's not just our employees that are out there kind of keeping our eyes and ears open, um, but we also, you know, we're happy. And this already happens in a lot of the communities that we're in, um, community members will call us and they'll say, hey, um, I saw this guy uh, in a bike lane or I saw someone riding without a helmet. Um, and we encourage that uh, because if you can just tell us the license plate number, um, which is the same size as any kind of motorcycle license plate, uh, uh, it's pretty easy, I think, to read the number if it's going past you. Um, just capture that and kind of the time um, and the date, and and we can we can do something about that. And we're very very proactive on that one. In just particular. To, add, to add to that, part of the reason we love community boards so much is because they you guys really help us uh, kind of make sure that people are being responsible using the service. So if you're out in the street and you see somebody parked illegally or riding on the bike lane. Our customer service number is available all over um, on the moped itself. If you do a quick Google search, unlike some of the other companies, they will pop up right away. And we really uh, encourage people to call us because we're very responsive and usually we'll, we'll be there in under an hour. So it's one of the many reasons we love talking to all of you. Yeah, um, and so to go through some of your, your other questions, um, the, uh, our incident rate is actually remarkably low for a company operating in transportation. Uh, so over 99.99% .99 of incidents, um, I'm sorry, 99.99% .99 of rides end without incident. Uh, and I think a lot of that has to do with how um, kind of like safety forward we are. Um, all the videos that are included in the app and the instructionals, um, the lessons that we offer um, generally uh, seven days a week and also in pop-ups around the city, uh, as well as um, kind of the, the driving, the driver screening, uh, requiring a driver's license, requiring people to be over the age of 21, kind of all of these things together um, result, uh, plus also the, uh, the suspension policy that we have, I think results in a, a relatively responsible user base. Um, so so our, we're actually really proud of our, our kind of safety record in that front. And then I think you also asked a question about um, the zone uh, and how that's determined. Um, it is uh, it really when you open the app, what you're looking at is the parking map. And so that's kind of telling you where you can park, where you can start or end your, your Revel ride, um, but you can drive anywhere. So um, as long as it's not over those major bridges that we talked about earlier, um, but yeah, you can, or a highway, you can't drive on highways either because they do not go fast enough. Um, but yeah, as long as you are, uh, um, you know, riding responsibly, you can ride outside of that zone, you can pause it while you're not using it, you just have to bring it back into the zone when you're done parking, uh, when you're done riding. Lauren, can I ask a clarification question on that? Do you have any uh, more specific data about like the number of crashes within your New York City specific or even any data yet from the Upper West Side or anything like that? I don't actually, um, off the top of my head right now, um, I, I do know that uh, there is a, the, the NYU is doing a study on us in particular as a mode of transportation um, and the safety uh, implications of that. And so that'll be coming out, um, I think in the next couple of months. Uh, so um, that'll, I think, uh, reveal kind of the real data. Okay, uh, we still have more committee members with their hands up. So let's see, uh, William Ortiz, go ahead. Hi, um, I just have a few questions. First of all, I love this idea. I love this, this company, this product. I think this is amazing. I think is what um, the city needs. A couple of questions. Um, could you, I'm, I, I'm not sure if you answered this already, but could you bring your own motorcycle class helmet on the ride if you feel uncomfortable using the one that's provided? Yes, as long as it's a Department of Transportation approved. Sorry. Yeah. 
uh, helmet, yeah, you can use that. Cool. Um, you mentioned you offer uh, safe, uh, like basically uh, lessons on how to ride mopeds, rules of the, of the road. Would you recommend cyclists, uh, cyclists, sorry, uh, riders um, to take, uh, say, a motorcycle training class, like at the uh, Motorcycle Safety School in the Bronx, to kind of just help them build that confidence to ride on the road? Uh, I'm someone who's ridden bikes all over the place, but I've never really done it on the road. So, and I also don't, <laughs> this is funny, I also don't have my license. So being on the road is something that's very scary to me, but this is something that's probably going to push me to get my license sooner. Um, so would you recommend for someone to kind of go through that and learning how to ride a bike, a, a motorcycle or a moped, uh, to then get into Revel? Um, so there is some value in that. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, there's definitely some value into doing a course like that. Uh, the only complication is that motorcycles typically have, um, a clutch. And so it's, it's very different. You might have to, um, clutch with your foot or with your hand, um, whereas Revels are, are a lot more straightforward uh, because they're electric, they're automatic, there is no clutch, there's no complications there. There's just, you know, similar to a bike, you have, um, you have kind of two brake levers uh, and you have a throttle and that's it. So you could definitely do the motorcycle course. Um, it's just above and beyond what you'd actually require to ride a, to ride a Revel. Thank you. And I have uh, just one more question. How, did you mention how long is the approval process? So if I go, I was just reading the website and I actually saw the bikes. I'm oh, sorry. I saw the mopeds uh, like two weeks ago, I think. I love, and I saw it and I thought it was great. How long is the approval process if I go online right now? Well, not me, maybe my brother, my dad. They go online and they, they seek to get a, a rebel uh, a pass. It, it should be around five minutes, um, unless there's kind of some, some complications with your, with your driving abstract. But other than that, it's relatively fast. Cool. Thank you so much. Okay. And still some more committee members and then some non-committee members. Uh, Roberta, go ahead. Hi. I have a couple of questions. A couple have been answered. Um, I, I thought the speed limit in the city was 25 miles per hour, not 30. It is, yeah. This is just fast enough to keep up with traffic. Um, we all know that even though the speed limit is 25 miles an hour, um, cars don't often abide by that. Um, that extra five miles per hour uh, additional speed allows you to just be safe, honestly, in the road. And electric cars don't make noise, so you can't always hear them, but many manufacturers put some kind of sound in the car so that if you're um, a pedestrian, you can hear, you can hear that a, a, um, an electric car is coming. Uh, what happens with the, the moped if I'm about to cross the street and I don't hear the moped? Yeah, so they have a whir sound to them. So they do have a sound, they're not absolutely silent. Um, so next time uh, you kind of see one kind of whizzing by, it does make a noise. Um, but they also do have horns uh, and they also have a kind of automatic blinker noise. Um, like, uh, well, I'm not gonna re replicate it for you guys, but um, it's like a, a beep, beep, beep when you uh, kind of hit the left turn signal or the right turn signal. Um, so if you're kind of at a crosswalk, um, you'll hear that noise audibly if you're a pedestrian. Thank you. Okay, uh, Andrew Albert. Go ahead. One of the questions er earlier uh, that Robert Espier asked was about the uh, charging life on these vehicles. Um, how soon before they are going to expire are, is Revel notified? And is there a way on the screen of the vehicle itself that the rider is notified that you are on a low battery? Yeah, so um, definitely. So when you open the app, um, before you even select which Revel you want to ride, because maybe there's a couple options uh, within a couple minutes walk of you, you can see how much battery charge and how much mileage there is on it. So it'll tell you, hey, this one has 45 miles of range, or this one only has 15 miles of range. So you can kind of choose which Revel you'd want to uh, take for your trip. Um, us on our back end, we can see kind of all the battery charges. So kind of depending on what we expect demand to be, depending on the weather, depending on lots of things, um, that kind of determines when we when we charge them and when we and when we kind of um, replace the batteries, uh, swap the batteries out. And 
how low does it get before Revel decides that they need charging? Five so miles we, left or 10 miles left or? So once it's below, um, I'd say 10% battery charge, it, it's not accessible to a user anymore. So a user can't see it on the map, it won't pop oh. up. Um, but we, I mean, we're, we're, it all depends on operational kind of need. That's something that our operations managers are deciding every day is um, at what level should we replace, uh, should we swap the batteries depending on the demand we expect, depending on um, our workforce, depending on our manpower, that sort of thing. Uh, but, but rarely are they sitting completely dead, honestly. We're always charging them preemptively because we want them to be accessible to users. Thank you. And the last thing I wanted to say was when you opened, you gave the example of how difficult it was to get from Williamsburg to Park Slope. The G train actually goes right from each one of those neighborhoods to the other. You might want to use Marine Park as another example when you start. Fair enough. Fair enough. I have taken the G train many times. I may be a little hard on the G train. Um, I do love the G train. Uh, but yeah, I do it know. Yeah, growing up on, on the Upper West Side, though, I do know that getting, you know, sometimes the Upper East Side or if you want to go into Harlem or Washington Heights, um, that's maybe more of a, a better example um, for this group. Thank you. But, but we honestly, as a company, we're, we're not trying to replace public transit. Um, and our users tell us that they're not using Revel to replace tra public transit either. Um, they're using Revel oftentimes to replace kind of Uber and Lyft rides um, that don't follow traditional public transit routes. Thank you. Okay, Christian Cordova, uh, one of the co-chairs of our Business and Consumer Issues Committee that we're now joined uh, for this meeting with has been having his hand up for a while. Go ahead, Christian. Okay, uh, uh, two questions. Um, in regards to parking on the, within the parking zone, uh, Manhattan in particular has more alternate site parking than the other boroughs. Um, do you just have people uh, move the uh, the uh, the the mop is from one side to the other. Uh, um, you know, once they were left parked uh, uh, legally, and the second question would be in regards to insurance. Um, do you recommend that the uh, rider have, uh, or will it will help the rider to have insurance on their own in case of, uh, uh, a, let's say, a bad accident? Uh, I know that you say that you include insurance, but does not, doesn't necessarily uh, protect the rider uh, uh, full liability. <laughs> yeah, so the insurance that the Revels that the Revel ride covers is mandated by the New York State Board of Insurance. Um, that's the amount that they told us we had to use and that's the amount that we do use. Uh, and it, it is it is third party liability insurance. So you're right, it is not health insurance. Um, similar to a car rental, it's uh, the, the insurance you get under a car rental is also not health insurance. And what about um, and the, uh, the parking issue? Yeah, so I'm sorry, I kind of missed that. Are you asking about alternate side parking? Yes. Yeah, so it's it's a user's responsibility to make sure that the moped is parked legally for 24 hours. Um, so, so when they end their ride, it has to be in a spot where there is no alternate side parking um, for at least 24 hours. And any tickets that are incurred within those 24 hours is the user's responsibility. Um, we charge the user directly for those tickets. Um, we endeavor as a company to make sure that that mopeds are not, excuse me, are not being left there to obstruct alternate side. Um, and so we have that team of people called Revel Rangers uh, who will go around and move mopeds and make sure that they're not obstructing kind of the, the sanitation uh, department. Well, thank you. A uh, related question I saw within the FAQ was about uh, a hypothetical scenario where the city converts to all paid parking. What would happen then, or is Rebels thinking about that future scenario? Honestly, I, I'm not sure. I really want to deal in that kind of hypothetical. Um, I'm, I'm, we're, we have a lot of support right now from the city, from the DOT, from city council, um, as being that kind of green transportation option. And so I'm, I'm sure we could we could work something out um, in the future. Okay, um, I know some committee members have raised their hand either newly or for a second time, uh, though Jay has been waiting for a very long time. So Jay Adolph, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I wanted to make sure, and, and uh, Jerry asked the question, as far as insurance is concerned, um, as you said at the beginning, under New York's uh, vehicle and traffic law, uh, these uh, vehicles are 
a vehicle as defined in that law. And that law um, carries a responsibility uh, uh, for um, uh, mandatory uh, liability insurance or, or at least financial responsibility. And um, under, uh, under New York law, um, automobile policies, vehicle policies do in, in fact include a uh, mandatory no fault insurance clause which covers injuries sustained by either the operator, passengers, or someone injured by a vehicle. So I just, I wanted you to confirm that your policy includes that and also uh, under vicarious liability in, this, in the state of New York, every owner of a vehicle uh, is responsible for the acts uh, of its operators. Uh, and can you give me a sense of the extent of coverage uh, that you have? Yeah, that's correct, Jay. So um, all of our insurance requirements are kind of outlined in, in that law that you mentioned. Um, and under the New York State Board of Insurance. Um, and so the, the policy right now is $50,000 um, uh, $50, for, for incidents. Which is the, the state mandated. Uh, it is, yeah, it's mandated by the state. Uh, honestly, our, our co-founders went to the state and said, we're launching this business. Um, tell us what insurance coverage we should have. And that is what they told us to use. Okay, yeah, that's, that's the minimum. You understand that under under vicarious liability, uh, the company itself in a given situation, if the exposure was beyond that uh, $50,000, mm -hmm. uh, the company would still be liable. Yes, and we do have an umbrella policy for a lot more than that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. That's it. I have no more questions. Okay, uh, Doug Kleinman, I know you've been uh, chatting some questions. It'd be great for you to verbally uh, ask yeah. some of them or maybe others you've had since then. Go ahead, Doug. Sure, thank you. Some of them have been answered. So uh, regarding the insurance, the question I had, and thank you for making that so clear about the $50,000. Uh, when you when one when someone rents a car, sometimes there's the option for supplemental insurance. I'm wondering if you have that option, if you make it available to uh, your customers. Um, and I. I'll just, uh, the other question is regarding the battery life expectancy, not for the charge, but for the expectancy itself. Um, what is the life expectancy? What do you do when the battery is reached its life expectancy? How do you dispose of it? Uh, just in terms of environmental concerns um, and the type of energy that you are purchasing to charge these batteries, are you going through green sources? Um, I don't want to laundry list here too too much. And the other question I had was uh, on your the employees of Rebel that go around and charge and uh, tune up the, the the mopeds. How are they getting to the vehicles? Are they using other Rebels? Are they using automobiles? How do they get there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so <laughs> I'm trying to take notes at the same time, so don't all right, miss all of your questions. Remind me of the first question again. Uh, well, the first question was, can you purchase additional liability insurance uh, okay. if you want more greater coverage? That is something we are exploring right now. It's not available, um, but it is definitely something we are exploring as an option. Um, your second question about the life expectancy of the batteries. Um, per the manufacturer, it's three years, um, which is pretty decent. Uh, and we have a kind of standing contract or relationship with a uh, with a lithium ion battery recycling company in the US um, that is kind of approved to work in the US. Um, and so uh, so that's kind of handled through them. Um, the employees piece, that's a good question, because I know there's always kind of concerns about like UPS trucks and kind of idling cars and things like that. Um, we have a pretty small fleet of commercial vehicles. Uh, they're kind of like um, like smaller kind of sprinter vans or vans. Um, that's where we we kind of transport our, our parts and, and 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 batteries that we need to kind of swap with. Um, and by small, I mean we have about uh, nine working right now, um, and so that covers three boroughs. Um, so you might see one um, once in a blue moon, but uh, but it's not going to be kind of idling on your street at all times. 
Because um, I, I kind of, I'm insinuating that's kind of what you're getting at with your question. Well, yeah, I, mean, I was curious what kind of vehicles they're using and also yeah. are, are those vehicles electric uh, or hybrids? Um, they are not right now. And that's because um, until very, very recently, um, there were no vehicles of that size uh, that were electric available in the United States. Um, I believe one, uh, one company has now just um, launched one, uh, but we're still kind of using our, ex our existing fleet. Uh, our employees do occasionally use Rebels to do work as well. It kind of depends on, on the scale. You obviously can't carry extra batteries, but you can do kind of minor maintenance and, and fixes. Um, so we do have some employees that go around on mopeds as well. And, and my final very quick questions. I know you mentioned that you work closely with city council. I saw the letter from Corey Johnson. Uh, which of the city council members in our district have you been in touch with? And, and again, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I'm sorry, I have to. I, I, I felt that you're answer to the question regarding crash data was uh, insufficient. I, I have to imagine that you know exactly how many crashes or injuries or you've had, and I'd, I'd rather you answer it in, in quantitatively, not percentage-wise. Again, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but data is super important, and, and it may be very encouraging data, but I, nevertheless, I'd like to know the number of crashes that you've yeah, I totally understand, Doug. Um, I I'm honestly cannot give you a number right now. Um, we can we can follow up with you um, offline uh, and provide you a number. Um, but I, I honestly I cannot recall it right now. I do not want to misstate that number because it's so important. Um, so I'm just not going to honestly. Uh, and and the other piece of of your question was which city which city council members in our district have you been in touch with? Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, so so you're um, sorry. There's just like a, a noise there. Um, Carol, can you help me out on this? I'm I'm blanking right now. We have Mark Bean um, and Helen Rosenthal. Uh, if that helps you. Okay, out. thank you. <laughs> yeah. So we this is our second community board tonight. So forgive me. Um, uh, Mark Levine has actually been a big fan of ours uh, since 2018, um, and has been asking us to kind of come. Into, into Manhattan. Um, and Helen Ro Rosenthal, um, we've been in contact with. Uh, we haven't yet kind of presented to her team um, just because this, this kind of Manhattan launch has come mid coronavirus. And so uh, we haven't had access to her, her office yet, um, but, uh, but she's definitely aware of us um, as of now, yeah. Thank you, thank you for answering all those questions. No Appreciate it. Okay. All right, uh, Robert, you have your hand up again and then after that, I'm going to go to some more community questions and some other questions that were coming through the chat. And Barbara, I see you too. Yeah, hi, the, the question was answered in the conversation over the insurance. So that I appreciate that elucidation. Uh, it's important to understand that, I think. Uh... Okay, thanks. And Barbara, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to um, ask Colleen, because I see that she's been sitting here, um, what kind of craft data or other information might you have on this that hasn't been mentioned yet? Um, is that, hi everyone, good night, it's Colleen Chattagun from DOT. So we don't have any crash data on hand that I know of that I can provide you with that information. That data would have to come from Revel. Um, and, and I'm sure they would share it with us. But off, the, off of my head, I don't recall seeing any crash data from Revel or even reviewing any. But um, I will definitely ask Borough Commissioner Pinkar if this came across him. Yeah, so we've actually been talking to, um, to DOT and, and the Department of, of City Planning as well about ways to share data. Um, sure, I mean, so who, who, from, who from DOT are you speaking with about sharing data? Just curious. Um, so the gentleman's name is um, I can't read it Michael Rapogel. Oh yeah, Mike Rapogel, okay. Yeah, yeah. so we did a presentation, uh, I'd say almost two weeks ago, um, Rapogel and then quite a few other people. Uh, mm -hmm. I can get a list of, of names for you um, in addition to city planning as well. Okay, that's great, I know Mike. Okay. Okay. All right, uh, we had another, oh, Mark, go ahead. Um, uh, it turns out that the host of the meeting doesn't have a raise hand function, so I had to do it the old fashioned way. <laughs> um, my, a lot of my questions were answered too, so I'm just gonna jump to one which is 
uh, parochial, which is um, this was presented to us um, as approved, um, not as something to be brought to the community board for our thoughts. Uh, I appreciate the offer to continue to dialogue. Uh, I'm curious what kind of inquiry or what kind of process led to the approval to um, expand to the Upper West Side. Yeah, so we touched base um, with uh, with the with the speaker of the city council um, and with council members across across Manhattan um, to make sure that they were okay with this and they were supportive of this before we decided to do this. And as and, and the DOT as well, which is that that um, presentation we did a couple of weeks ago that I just mentioned as well. Um, so they were on board. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Uh, one of the community member questions was, are you tracking illegal use in Central Park and on the Greenway? Actually, yes. Um, so uh, anytime a moped kind of enters a portion of Central Park where cars are not allowed, um, an alert gets sent to our customer support team and they reach out immediately. Um, and same goes for Prospect Park and kind of other major uh, green spaces. Another question, you already spoke a little bit about um, not enabling rebels to go from Manhattan uh, on major bridges to Queens or Brooklyn, but there was a question about can healthcare workers living in Manhattan that, who healthcare workers who live in Manhattan but work in Queens or Brooklyn's hospitals use rebels to get to the boroughs. It sounds like maybe not via those bridges that you mentioned, but if you could comment on that briefly. Yeah, unfortunately right now, no. Um, I mean, we'll see, like we're, as a company, we like to kind of move slowly um, and really test things and receive feedback. And so right now bridges are not allowed, but maybe in the future they, they will be. Um, it really depends. Okay. Uh, there was another question about charging by the minute um, and whether or not charging by the minute could perhaps inadvertently encourage speeding or red light running and why not charge by the mile. So if you could share Rebel's thoughts on that. Yeah, definitely. So, um, so you really cannot physically speed on the moped. Um, you can't go faster than 30 miles an hour, even if you were um, downhill pulling the throttle all the way back, uh, the moped will break. Um, so you can't even pick up speed faster than 30 miles an hour. Um, but uh, I do understand the, the concern in terms of, of having people feel like there's a clock ticking. Um, honestly, the majority of our users, uh, one of their comments is they're surprised at how affordable Redville actually is. Um, and that's because they're really comparing it to what they would normally use Uber and Lyft for. Um, so, you know, a 20 minute ride is, seven dollars six something right um and so uh you can get pretty far um in 20 minutes okay thanks uh another comment from the community not really a question but more of a comment about um some of the percentages even a 0.01 percent accident rate seems very high to them and they don't think that would be acceptable on mass transit i understand your comment about not wanting to know incorrect statistics but well i think we'll all definitely appreciate more information around the data around that afterward sorry meg um i'm i'm looking at the chat and i do want to clarify the mopeds are throttled at 29 miles per hour so um yeah sorry yeah. about that thanks okay. for the clarification carol all right, and then we have some more hands going up as well. So, William, why don't you go again? William Ortiz. I have three questions who are really easy. Um, an out-of-state license would be valid to ride in New York City. An out like from Chicago or uh, Illinois. Or, okay, cool, easy. Yes. Um, who is the manufacturer of these mopeds? Uh, New. It's a company called New N I U. Um, it is. Yeah, it's a it's a company that's known for. Um, uh, they're known for kind of a very high quality product. Um, they're doing a lot of innovative stuff in the electric vehicle space. Okay. Uh, and the third question is, <clears throat> um, so I work in technology and data and privacy is something that's very important to me. So I, I'm just wondering when you register with Revel, what type of shared data are being sent to affiliates? Um, and what type, what, what information of ours that we're sharing with you is potentially going out to other, other uh, companies? Yeah, that's definitely a fair concern in, in these in this day and age. Um, we don't view ourselves as like a user data collection company at all. We don't sell our data. We never intend to sell our data. 
Um, that's just not where we want to be. We're an operator, we're a transportation provider. Um, and so we comply with kind of all international um, European regulations on privacy. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. All right, Rich, go ahead. Yeah, so um, thank you for coming to us. I know we're, we're not easy. Um, but two questions. One is, um, I've been really closely watching the NYPD crash data uh, that reports every crash in the city. Uh, do you know how Revel mopeds are classified? Um, are they classified as motorcycles or bicycles uh, in this crash data? I don't know how they would be classified in the crash data. Um, I believe it's kind of the, the officers who are responding to the crash um, will kind of indicate what type of vehicle it is. Um, they're technically an LMB, uh, limited uh, use moped. Okay. And you had said before that you can get us better crash data since you don't have it on the top of your head. Is that something you'll commit to providing to us? Uh, if I can, yeah. And I, I think I also mentioned that um, I know NYU is doing an independent study. Um, to kind of look at our data um, and Great. compare is that it to other Sarah doing transportation. It? Is that Sarah uh, yes, Kaufman? it is actually. Sarah Kaufman, um, the study should be ready in the next week, and we'll be happy to share that. That's great. And apologies if I missed it, but as far as the Upper West Side, I know you're doing it uh, now because there's some hospitals. Have you been approved for the Upper West Side, or what's the status for um, coming to the Upper West Side? Yeah, so it's it's definitely a different situation and, and shouldn't be maybe confused with um, with e-bikes and, and e-scooters, um, which are you know kind of in this gray area. They're progressing towards legal. Um, Revel mopeds are 100% street legal and regulated under New York State. Um, but as a company, we were really adamant that we want to make sure that we're working with local politicians and local electeds to make sure that this is acceptable to them um, and that they're happy with us. And so, um, so we have been in touch with Councilmember Mark Levine um, and with, with Helen Rosenthal, Rosenthal's office as well, um, Speaker Corey Johnson. Um, we can uh, maybe share our, our press release on this, but um, we had quotes from um, Speaker uh, uh, City Council Corey Johnson was very supportive, um, Bill Perkins. Um, and, and several others as well. I guess a related question would be uh, your rapid expansion in the Upper West Side was in part due to COVID and partnering with hospitals in Northern Manhattan. Um, and is the plan then, we don't know what the future holds and how long various COVID response, um, high intensity COVID response measures will be necessary and what the kind of slow process of return to normalcy and kind of reopening of things will look like, but is the intention that now that Revel is on the Upper West Side that it stays on the Upper West Side? We're just kind of taking it day by day, honestly. Um, you know, our, our healthcare program, our free membership program was originally just until April 30th. And now we're like, oh, wow, we have to extend that. Like, that's just not nearly long enough. Um, and so it's all kind of a new world for us. Um, I think our hope is that we become kind of a permanent part of the community. Um, but we're definitely, uh, we're definitely playing it um, day by day at this point. We've got another raised hand. Ken, go ahead. Um, two questions. One, uh, about speeding and one about public assistance. Um, the, uh, um, I just wanted to point out that in almost every street in the city, uh, 29 miles an hour is speeding. Um, and so uh, aren't you encouraging uh, your drivers to speed and why wouldn't you ratchet it back to 25 instead of 29, which is the speed limit? Yeah, I understand that concern. So um, LMB, the class of moped that, um, that a Revel is, um, the, the, the definition of that under New York state law is 30 miles an hour or 29 miles an hour. Um, and so, uh, so we're just kind of complying with that. Um, and also just, I think in, in experience would say as someone who rides Revel, as someone who also rides bicycles, as someone who also drives cars, um, I, I appreciate having the ability to sometimes um, keep up with traffic. Um, and I actually think that Revels, uh, this is a personal opinion, have a um, kind of a effect of slowing down traffic to some degree because they are closer to the speed limit than most cars are. Um, so yeah, I, I understand your concern, but that is actually the, the, 
29 miles an hour is, is um, part of the definition of this type of moped under New York state law. Yeah, well, unfortunately 25 in most places in New York is just, just a suggestion. Um, uh, the other question is about um, public assistance. Uh, you give a discount for um, people on public assistance. How do you define public assistance and would it include people who are in NYCHA housing? Uh, yes, it would. Carol, do you want to kind of expand on this one? Yes, so it would definitely include anybody living in NYCHA and it could be any sort of public assistance, whether it's at the city level, state or federal. We make it very easy. Um, one of our customer support team members that actually passes the, the type of membership. Yeah, so they just have to submit some sort of um, example, um, like a, you know, a resident ID or um, or you know, a food stamps form or application or whatever. We actually make it really easy. There's no kind of like defined list. Um, they, they submit it uh, and they, they will get approved by customer support. Thank you. Okay, I've been, I think most, all of the questions in the Q and A were answered and most in the chat have been answered if I missed any. Uh, you know, we can also of um, others. Go ahead. Uh, just you can give your um, contact information if people have additional questions. We covered so, uh, so many details of the program. If if additional questions uh, occur to people, it, it would be possible for them to follow up with you on a one on one basis offline. Yeah, definitely. Um, my email is uh, Lauren Vreens V R I E N S at GoRevel.com. Um, but Meg, maybe you want to. I guess I can also type it in the chat. Maybe that's the easiest thing to do. Uh, so you guys can follow up um, for sure. Great. Thank you both. All right. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you for so much. I really appreciate really, it. This is, hang on just one second. I'm sorry. This is Mark. I just want to make sure that the attendees um, have asked their questions uh, since they can't or they may or may not know how to raise their hands. So there is still the chat and the Q&A. Just you know, let's take one quick pause to make sure that we've captured everything from the folks who are not panelists because we're using that this this format. So attendees, uh, it, it's now your chance if you uh, if you want it. I know that uh, Meg and Howard have been going to their uh, questions on Q and A for sure. But if somebody wants to speak, um, now would be the time, right? But I'm not seeing it. Okay, we also have given them the contact information, so if they have questions, they could certainly follow up. Excellent. Definitely. All right, I'm done. Thank you so much. Hope Thank you, have a good you night. so much. Thank Keep you for having work. us. Really Take appreciate care. it. Take care. Bye bye. Um, well, our next agenda item is was raised by Rich Robbins. It regards the um, the request to have more pedestrianized space given the um, the the pandemic and the need for social distancing. There is a concern that. Um, you know, on, on garbage night, you literally almost come into contact with uh, people you're passing on side streets. And so there was um, um, a friendly amendment to our transportation committee resolution at last week's full board meeting asking the city to increase the amount of pedestrianized space. And I will defer to Rich Robbins, who has a, a follow up on that. It, it regards how the city should pedestrianize the space. Uh, Rich, are you there? I am here. Okay. And I have sure. a, a new resolution uh, that really echoes what a number of elected officials have said. Um, I saw a statistic that uh, an organization, Streetlight Data, reported that vehicle miles traveled in Manhattan on April 3rd, which I guess is the day they did it, was down 92%. So with traffic being so massively reduced uh, and such a need for outdoor space and public space and many people in our community, especially the elderly, uh, both not living near parks, not having easy access to parks, being scared to walk on the sidewalks to get to parks, being concerned that parks are overly crowded uh, and with the streets having extra capacity, proposing that, uh, and echoing what Gail Brewer and Corey Johnson and Donis Rodriguez and Mark Levine and others have said, uh, that we really need to convert streets to public space 
uh, and there's um, the easy ability to do so. Uh, Mayor de Blasio did a very, very limited um, trial of closing just four streets, one in each borough um, for a few days. And that um, was nowhere near the Upper West Side. It was Park Avenue South in Manhattan. And even that limited trial was closed because um, Mayor de Blasio did not want to um, put extra, uh, require extra resources from the depleted uh, New York City uh, Police Department, which makes sense. But um, as Gail Brewer and others have said is we don't need the police to do this. We can do this without the police. Uh, so I wanna propose a resolution calling for New York City uh, and through DOT to close a large number of streets. Uh, one main one that has been proposed is Broadway, uh, but really any other street that can possibly be closed either in part or in full uh, to allow for more public space for pedestrians to um, be able to get outside and get exercise, get fresh air uh, in, in this awful time that we're dealing with. So uh, I wrote up a proposal, a, a resolution, which I sent to Howard and Meg uh, but didn't get to do it until fairly recently. I'm going to put it in the chat right now. Uh, Chris, so that you want me to put it up on share? Yeah, it was right before the meeting. I haven't been able to look. Yeah, and, and I just put it in chat um, so that anyone who has access should be able to see it. Um, I don't know if uh, folks want me to read the whole thing. Or just the. Um, the Rich, why don't you read the um, where the uh, the actual resolution, not the whereas clauses? Okay, so um, basically, I, I I frame it by just saying how uh, you know we've got a pandemic. Uh, there are major risks. The city New York uh, limits all citizens from going anywhere. Parks still are open. Uh, but they're recommending that people stay at least six feet away from each other. And num numerous elected officials have called for conversion of streets to public space. So uh, therefore Community Board 7 Manhattan resolves that number one, we support calls from Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, City Council uh, Chair Corey Johnson, City Council Transportation Chair uh, Udonis Rodriguez and other elected officials, community boards and community groups close as many streets as possible on the Upper West Side, including but not limited to Broadway to convert them into public space as quickly as possible. Number two, that New York City deploy traffic controlling devices such as plastic bollards to greatly reduce the need for NYPD to enforce these open streets. And then the third thing, uh, somewhat of a separate but related issue is that uh, even though traffic has gone so significantly down, uh, the number of automatic speeding tickets from speed cameras actually went up in March, which is horrifying. And so number three is that the NYPD step up enforcement of speeding on the Upper West Side, given the increase in speeding by reckless drivers and concerns that first responders who are addressing to the pandemic should not have the extra burden of caring for victims of traffic crashes. So um, all, as I see it, real common sense things echoing what uh, many in the community, many elected officials are calling for. Uh, and I think something that needs to happen as soon as possible. Okay, I see a hand up from committee member William Martinez. Go ahead, William. Cool, thank you, Meg. Um, I think Rich has a, Rich's plan was uh, in the right place as far as trying to help um, our neighbors kind of deal with this pandemic. But I think there's a lot of issues that it's not, that this is not going to solve or, or, or I think we'll create some new issues um, like, first of all, I, I think if you start blocking out large sections of the streets, traffic will then get consolidated to one or two streets. And my concern with that is emergency vehicles trying to get to and from hospitals. As of right now, they can go wherever they want and how fast they want emergency vehicles. And that's really important. I can't think of how many lives were saved. The, the fact that someone could like get from 77th Street to St. Luke's in like two minutes instead of it being an eight minute ride. So that's my major concern with the street closure. Number two, you mentioned the speeding uh, of the speeding. Uh, um, speeding has increased. That kind of reminds me. I hate to kind of bring this up, but it, of of our bike culture, because there's this sense, there's this lawlessness that there is right now. There isn't cops. There aren't people checking up on you. So I think vehicles are just going because they think they can. 
Um, so that's, I don't think this would change that. Um, my other concern is time limit. How long, if we were to do this, how long are we gonna do it for until Cuomo says everybody back to work? Um, mm -hmm. So there, that's my concern there. And the other thing is it, it makes sense, but it, it, at the same time, it doesn't make sense. Why would, we why would we allocate space like tree closure when we're recommended not to go outside? You know, I went to the grocery store today and it looked like I was robbing a bank because I was wearing a bandana, but that's because I had to go out. And the last time I went out was about 10 or 12 days ago. Um, so I don't, I don't think this is going to make things any better as far as uh, overall helping out on New Yorkers. I really do. I, my major concern is emergency vehicles getting to and from, uh, you know, to and from hospitals. Because if you have a block closed off and people are there, how are you going to have them all move if a vehicle needs to get to someone? So um, I do not agree with this resolution as it currently stands. All right, let's get some thoughts from others. Sarah, I saw your hand go up next. Yeah, um, I basically support this resolution. Um, I have been <laughs> calling for this as well. Um, I think that William's uh, point is the main thing that we need to take into consideration and make sure is accommodated for. Ambulances need to be able to get two people and get them to the ER, A absolutely, like 100%. Um, so what I think, so I don't think you can close any cross streets because then, you know, if someone on the cross street needs an ambulance, it can't get there like that, I don't think is reasonable. Um, I've been, you know, every time I go out to the store, I've been delivering groceries to people. When I'm on Broadway, there's almost no traffic. So I don't think that the concern of like, if you close Broadway, the traffic from Broadway is going to go somewhere else is a concern right now. There's almost zero traffic. Um, what I think we could do is, you know, leave like one lane of Broadway open so that emergency vehicles and buses can continue to move through there um, and then just open up more space. I think William, um, you know, to your point, you went to the grocery store today because you needed to. Well, everybody needs to go to the grocery store sometimes. I, like I said, I was out today delivering groceries to people. I mean, the, the sidewalks were packed. Like there were so many people on them. And if I had been able to go out into a, a street space so that we had probably like, I guess about triple the sidewalk width because there's the sidewalk and then maybe one or two lanes also. I mean, it would have been so much easier to stay away from people to keep that distance. Like it was, it's kind of scary walking when you can't, you know, you're trying to keep your six feet distance and I'm wearing a mask, but a lot of people aren't wearing masks. Um, so I agree that, you know, we're not supposed to be going out like just willy nilly whenever we need to, but there are people out there. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think for some people you just need to get out of your apartment now and then and just get a little fresh air. Um, so giving people that chance to have a little more space to be in, um, I think would be really good. I, I guess maybe I would just, instead of saying, um, to close as many streets as possible. I mean, maybe that that could be toned down a little. It's not like we're looking to totally close off the Upper West Side to vehicles, especially um, you know ambulances, but we do wanna create a little more space. That's all. Uh, Christian, go ahead. Well, <clears throat> I'm with William on this one. Um, it's, still not, it's not just uh, ambulances, we also have commercial traffic to consider because uh, we still have to have deliveries in this uh, in the city. I do I will support though, uh, uh, our, so some streets closing, that's, that makes sense to me. Um, uh, no Broadway though. And, uh, and if streets are, are, if sidewalks are crowded it's because people are just going on unnecessarily also. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, here on Central Park West, uh, we have ambulances going up and down all the time. Um, also, the uh, uh, in, in uh, the the mayor on today's uh, uh, press conference was asked this question also, and especially they also uh, referred to the model that Oakland is using, and uh, he said that after consultation with the police department, uh, they just uh, uh, they decided uh, uh, that the the Oakland model really didn't apply to New York City because of uh, different circumstances. And he just doesn't want to do it with the police. He just uh, feels that police is necessary, uh, uh, not just for safety, but also because uh, uh, they also, one of the things that they are shaking on is on the uh, uh, people not crowding over, you know, so there's just no crowds. So that, that was his major uh, uh, concern, I guess. But I, I would support uh, particular streets. I just 
kind of blankly say just close as many streets as, as you can. All right, some other transportation committee members, Elizabeth, go ahead. Sure, just two things. Um, the first question is just a question to the committee chairs why this was not added to tonight's agenda. And and this looks like a pretty um, pretty well written, well thought out resolution um, that was presented tonight. So that's my first question. I think we owe it to the public to have a chance to review these things before they come before a vote by our committee. Secondly, um, I think many of you know Ryan Russo, um, who came before our transportation committee many times. He was um, a member of the DOT here in New York. He's now the transportation commissioner um, in Oakland. I think before we do a vote, we can have him come and do a Zoom chat with us to talk about what's working in Oakland and what might work here in New York before we do a vote like this. Um, I, I am just, I'm really surprised that this is the second time this has happened on this committee where we've had these issues come up. And again, I think we all want safe streets. We want um, wider streets. We want people to be safe and healthy. Um, but I just think the process on this has not been handled particularly well and want to make sure we do this in the right way. Thanks. Um, I'll just point out, I received the um, resolution 20 minutes before the start of this meeting. So this is this is a limited ability to add it to the agenda. Well, Howard, that's bullshit. I, that's total yeah. bullshit. I emailed you about this a few days ago. No, I'm talking about the the actual resolution, but the idea that no. this wasn't on the agenda. Rich, is, so it, I, can I just make a point? Within one hour of of getting your your email, I asked to have it put on. There are logistical problems. There is a pandemic on. Things don't happen as quickly and if as and and as efficiently as they usually do. It was missed. I'm sorry, I wish it were on. Again, I, I forwarded the email as, as my co-chair and Mark know to Penny. It just, there's, there are delays now, we're in a pandemic. Everyone wishes it was on. The question is, should this stop the conversation now because it didn't, it didn't get on quickly? My answer is yes. Look at the community questions and answers yeah. where there are people asking questions about why this, from the public, about why this wasn't on the agenda sooner because we have exigent circumstances. That's why people are aware we're in a pandemic, that's all. I agree with Elizabeth. And I think this is outrageous, Howard. I, yeah. And this committee has some sort of a hidden agenda and the whole community is onto it. When you read the comments uh, on the last, for instance, the West Side Rag piece, it's shocking and humiliating that I'm a member. Barbara, as I said, I, put the, I tried to put this on within an hour of hearing about it. That's yeah. a fact. There's something disingenuous about this. I am sorry. And also, there are many people from the community who would definitely have been here tonight had they heard that this issue was on the agenda. Absolutely. That Absolutely. Noted only as a presentation from Revel. I'm sorry. I'm a no for this. Yeah. I, I want to acknowledge a few things. The issue was raised over the weekend. Howard did immediately shoot a note to. I think there are some, some issues that are recurring for this committee. I think there are some similar challenges that are experienced by other issues at time with different logistics and how chairs work with different members of the uh, district office team with Mark. Some, I think some things we can talk about at steering because I think occasionally some of the other committees experience some of these challenges as well. So some of it is tied to that. Some of it I think is tied to issues um, related to other discussions particular to this to this committee and debates that this committee and the community have had that make these type of communi communication issues uh, feel uh, and be experienced even more deeply in light of the discussions that this committee has been having over the past several months. Um, I do think that, you know, Rich working really just this evening to draft this right before the meeting, he was trying to have some text available for people to react to. And I thank Rich for doing that because this issue, uh, this committee and some others have struggled with voting without being able to look at words. Um, so I thank Rich for doing that. And I think in the, you know, we all on the community board are trying to struggle with how to respond to the pandemic situation in a more real time manner while also dealing with communication challenges and public notification challenges and concerns about how delayed things get when they get put off a month. Um, Mark, I don't know if you as chair have specific thoughts about discussion or this or Howard, if you wanna do more, but I wanted to 
um, hopefully in a, a, a tone of respect to everyone, acknowledge that a lot of different folks working on this are both upset about it, but also struggling with process issues behind the scenes that not everyone is dealing with. So I, I think there are a range of things that did not go well for this and just wanted to recognize them all. Sure. So I, is now a convenient time for me to, to offer a few thoughts? Thank you. Yep. Um, the first is to acknowledge that um, when everybody's working from home in the district office, things don't happen as fast as any of us would like. That's just a reality. Um, that doesn't mean that we ignore the need to give ample notice to the public. Um, and this is an area where I think um, I am troubled by I would be troubled um, by this, even though I might other, under other circumstances be want to, want to be supportive. Excuse me, I'm tripping over my tongue here. I would want to be supportive of this initiative, um, but, it, but it doesn't have the specifics that I would want um, and, it, and it didn't have the advanced notice that I would want. And that's no fault of anybody's. Everybody's working uh, very hard under very oh, different- It's an ongoing issue though. This has been going on way longer than the pandemic. Well, Richard, we can't get me, anything on the agenda here. We are trying, we were making some pretty good progress before the pandemic started about revamping how things work at the full board and then everybody disappeared. Um, I'll own my share of that. Uh, it's not entirely me, but, in, but it is still the case that we have to deal with the challenges of process and procedure that we are dealt as cards. Um, there, uh, so, so I am troubled by voting on this tonight. Um, there are also aspects But not of voting on it is effectively killing it. I mean, we're losing a month if we don't vote on it. I understand, but sometimes, first of all, we already voted. Part of my concern is that this is simply an amplification of something we already voted for, and that was on last week's resolution. And so what I would favor doing is writing to the DOT, communicating our resolution, and including in it a request for them to tell us where they think they can do this. Um, and I'm looking right at poor Colleen, who's eventually gonna be called upon here, um, uh, to, to do it that way, rather than for us to start prescribing streets without, uh, and here's my, you know, so um, I agree with the concerns about making sure that ambulances, food delivery trucks and other delivery trucks get through. Um, I don't know that I know enough right now to say where we can do this and where we can't um, consistent with that concern. Um, the, the resolution, I know it was, uh, it was drafted hastily and in part um, uh, in response to my request that we have something to look at um, when I heard that we we're gonna do this tonight, um, but it doesn't actually make the point that this is temporary. Uh, and certainly this has to be um, a temporary because if there is going to be closing of streets, and I know that's something that may come before this committee, um, but that has to be done with a lot of public process and certainly not setting a, setting a template now. Um, the, um, and, and I would wanna be, I would wanna make sure that whatever we recommend does accomplish the goal that uh, Borough President Brewer set out for this, which is that it does not put another burden on the police department. Um, the police department, as I heard it today, is down about 20% of its workforce and scrambling to cover things. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that the increase in speeding tickets is because of the machine-driven ones, um, because they have um, they're, they're scrambling to cover their shifts, let alone keep access to hospitals and, and all of that sort of thing uh, open. So I think this is a good idea, but I'm not ready to vote for it right now because of the concerns that are nobody's fault, but that can't be overcome in this meeting. There, I see Colleen actually wants to respond, so I'll let Colleen go, and then there are a few other committee members with their hands up. I was just going to say that um, the mayor um, received a request as well regarding consideration of opening um, additional few streets. There was a letter that was sent um, by the elected officials in Community Board 4 um, requesting a consideration of it. And CB4 also supports this. 
they provided certain streets that the DOT should take a look at for consideration. The other thing is that we also received a letter from um, Bar President Beer Brewer and also from Assembly Member Rosenthal. So I know I, I had a conference call with Borough Commissioner Pinkar this morning and he mentioned that he is going to, or he's having a conference call with our commissioner tomorrow to talk about you know, the letters that we received to consider or examining reopen, cer reopening certain streets for um, pedestrians. At the moment, um, we don't know yet what we're gonna do because the thing is, is that we don't even know when all of this is going to be reopened, when we're gonna be able to go back to work. So we don't wanna do things premature or we don't want to do things hastily where we feel that you know there might be another setback i mean rich i do really think your resolution is excellent you always you know hit on great points but um if you feel or if the board feels that this is something that we should really consider and as liz mentioned that you know it should be put on the agenda you know, I really don't see an issue why, you know, we can't, it, it can be added to next month's agenda and, you know, for others to opine in it. Because at the moment, we don't even know if we're going back or I don't even know if I'm going back to work in May or June. We don't know where things stand right now. Yeah, but we lose a month. What I would propose is, and since we need full board support anyway, why don't we just mm -hmm. do a mini transportation meeting before full board? I mean, it's up to the board if they want to do that. It's up to you guys. Yeah thing for people to mull over while I call on other folks with their hands raised. Ken, go ahead. Um, yeah, that's certainly a, a possibility. Um, otherwise, we really lose two months because we would be discussing this at our May committee meeting and then voting on it in June at the June full board. Um, I think we're, we're in an emergency situation now. Um, and uh, if it was an emergency, you know, like a water main break or something, uh, the DOT would close the street. And um, in a sense, this is a similar kind of, of an emergency. Um, and uh, if, we, if we have a problem with the process, I think there are two different things. We have, some people have a problem with the process and then there's the substance. And if we have a problem with the pr process, that's one thing. But if we're in an emergency situation, it's very dangerous to let something about process uh, throw uh, substance out the window. I understand that business improvement districts um, from uh, the West Village up to 53rd Street are also calling for more open streets. Um, Oakland, it, it's, uh, what they're doing has been thrown around. They're actually opening up 74 miles and uh, it's not like Oakland is usually thought of as a pedestrianized city. Um, so uh, I think we can do a lot better. I think we can, um, uh, we can do something either before the next full board meeting as a committee, or the alternative is to do what Mark was sort of suggesting and uh, send a letter amplifying our previous resolution, incorporating much of what Rich is proposing into a letter to DOT, which could go out tomorrow. Okay, Doug's been waiting for a while. Go ahead, Doug. Thanks. Uh, you know, I, I'm very conflicted on this. Uh, my experience has been walking down various avenues, Broadway, Amsterdam, uh, I find myself zigzagging. There are some narrow points and I find it sometimes difficult to, um, you know, stay within, you know, away you know, six feet or more from somebody. Um, the points that were brought up, you know, um, by William and, and, and Jerry and, and, and Elizabeth, uh, yes, on process, but also, um, Emergency vehicles, uh, I mean, I live on Amsterdam Avenue and I cannot begin to tell you um, how many, there's a lull right now, how many vehicles uh, I yeah. hear. And um, I don't, what, I, what I'm not understanding and maybe someone can help me, I don't, we are in an emergency situation, no doubt about it. What is emergent about expanding the streets? What is emergent? What's emergent to me is emergency vehicles, making sure that deliveries get to Fairway and CVS and Duane Reed and any restaurants that are open for delivery and pickup. I'm afraid this could add confusion 
Um, I do, on the other hand, and obviously I'm illustrating my confusion here, I can see that there are many other people like in the chat, uh, crossing guards who are out of work right now, could, you know, auxiliary police, I, I can see some um, wrangling and some help, but I, I'm afraid it may add more confusion. And the other thing is, you know, when we, we say close Broadway, it's, so, what do you mean close Broadway forever? Where, where, on both lanes, north and south? Where, where does Fairway, how do they get their deliveries? How does CVS, do we, so I, it, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling and, I'm, and I, I, I sound very conflicted because I am. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, thank you for letting me ramble. And questions I'm hearing from multiple people about specificity of what we're recommending and the, the devil in the details. Uh, let's see, Elizabeth, go ahead. No comment. I'm I'm just weighing in. I'll, I'll weigh in over chatter and you guys can decide. I'm just, I, I go back to that, you know, is this really the most urgent item of all the things our transportation committee could be dealing with in this crisis right now? When we literally have MTA workers who are dying, who are transporting, you know, people, uh, you know, I know that we want open streets. We all want them. We want that stuff getting done. Um, but I think tonight's discussion, we need to really, if, if we are really focused on um, the most urgent needs for the city right now, like everyone and, and Rich, you're saying, if this resolution had been about that, I would have been 100% behind it tonight. For this, the, the biggest issue I have is that the public just has not been notified to be a part of this conversation. And I don't think we can vote um, on something and, and have a re resolution as a result of that. That's all. Okay. There were a few more people who have been waiting and then let's come back to how to move forward. Julian, you haven't spoken yet. Go ahead. I, I'm, I, I agree with a lot of what everyone's been saying. And I, I do think that while I personally uh, sort of agree with what's going on, um, I find that too, uh, first it's, it's, it's not fair that the public was not informed of this beforehand. And it, would, it wouldn't be fair to the, to the community and to the public if we made a decision at this meeting. Um, and, and I, but I also understand that you know, this is an important issue and we should address it, but also at the same time, that is an issue that personally, I don't feel I have, I have enough knowledge or understanding or, or about to, to make a decision. I, I feel like if I was to, to name streets that I think should be closed off the top of my head, I would, I would not be able to make anything with any, any sort of justification behind it. And so I feel maybe a, a good compromise could be either or doing something like what Mark suggested and, um, and including it in the letter or potentially, you know, having a short transportation meeting before full board next month, but potentially uh, if, if, if we really, if we, if we care about this, but don't want to go too strongly on it, maybe, maybe the phrasing about it isn't, we want Broadway to be closed and maybe other streets, but more, we want the prospect of street closures um, as a means of, you know, promoting, you know, social distancing to be considered by DOT. And maybe that, maybe that is, is satisfies us conveying the message that we think this, this could be something valuable while also not, um, you know, not stepping or uh, mm. I'm losing words, but, but I, I think Julian, yeah, okay. we, I just to point of information, the full board has already adopted that in uh, at our la at last week's meeting we called on and it was a very broad and general call for more pedestrianized space so that people can social distance. As I, when I introduced this, this, this resolution tries to give more detail on that, but the, the broad call for more pedestrian, pedestrianized space has already been adopted by this board. It was adopted last week. Got it, okay. I think, I think there could, you, could, you could phrase it different ways, but it could be a specific call to be like, uh, look into you know, certain streets that, that like specifically focus on pedestrianized use, maybe residential streets in particular, or you know, with, with the intention of social distancing, because maybe, maybe, maybe the solution is more limited or different than we, than we actually think it is right now. Again, I, well, I, my original thought, this, this is my thought weeks ago, was to at, make it clear to the city that people need space. People need space to social distance. I know you're supposed to be quarantining, quarantine, but it, it's great to get outside. So we, my thought was have a general call and leave it to the city, the experts at the city, to figure out how to expand the pedestrianized space. This resolution gives the city a little more detail as to exactly what um, people think the community board should want to see. And so it's, it's a more detailed resolution.
But again, the general call has already been made. This is this is some specifics. That's what's what we're discussing tonight. Uh, who has? Oh, um, Doug has his hand. And up. It was just a follow up. I, I, I guess, and I've heard this voiced by some elected officials and even the mayor. But how do the last thing we would want to do is encourage convening? Like, so you don't yeah. want it to be like a street fair. And then, in order to prevent that, you have to have law enforcement to if people start to view this as you know a street fair so how, how do how do you, how, how do how does everybody think about that how do we prevent that from happening when we're being told generally to stay in except for shopping and some moderate exercise and i know getting out is very important from people's physical and mental health but how do you if you open up a whole street and uh, I, I i'm just i'm 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 concerned that it's somewhat paradoxical Anyone else? Anyone else? Uh, uh, Sarah. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say, you know, none of us are urban planners or traffic planners. So I think that the need for like deep specificity is not something we should be so concerned about here. I think that that's something that DOT would figure out. Um, obviously, we can express what we think the community's needs are in terms of, you know, access for ambulances, access for delivery trucks. But I don't think it's our job to, you know, figure out the solution. It's to tell DOT what it is that we want. So um, to that extent, maybe Mark's idea really is the best is just to send another letter saying we passed this resolution at full board last week. We want to reemphasize that this is something the community, you know, is desirous of. And we've talked about it again at, at you know, transportation, whatever. Um, I think, uh, you know, I just wanted to say again, my now, first I say I'm not an urban planner, then I say I have one idea, which is again to just <laughs> close um, lanes of Broadway, not the whole thing, you know, not all of the northbound lanes or all of the southbound lanes, but a few maybe. Um, and I don't think the, the convening is going to be an issue. I think if as long as you don't have seats, people don't convene, like people aren't going to sit down on, in the middle of a street for a picnic the way they might sit down in Central Park for a picnic, that's an issue we have seen. Um, I think people would use the space to, again, just stay further away from other people as they're walking to go get their groceries or as they're taking a run. Um, so I don't think the convening is gonna be an issue. And I just would reiterate again that at, being out on the sidewalks, it's really hard. Our sidewalks are narrow in a lot of places and it's hard to keep apart from people. So I support it. Mark, I think you wanted to say something. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make clear because the idea of a letter is being talked about, but I'm not sure that we're all talking about the same letter. Mm -hmm. um, the letter that I have in mind is one that effectively would transmit last week's resolution with the um, with Ken's amendment in it. Um, it would then say, uh, and, and my next comment is proceeding on the fact that a lot of smart people are on this call and we're coming up with more questions than answers through this discussion. Um, and so the letter that I would propose we send is say uh, in, in, in words or substance, A, we have this resolution and, it, and for very good reasons, it calls for more pedestrianized space. And then pick up some of what Rich was uh, able to pull together in the draft that we saw about other elected officials who have uh, supported the notion. Um, and then to make an open-ended request that DOT suggests to us places where the goals that we have could be accommodated, those goals being not putting undue pressure or stress on the NYPD, making sure that vehicles that need to get through do get through, and making sure that we don't encourage behavior that shouldn't be encouraged. Um, and if there's more, there's more. Um, that's the letter that I would propose to send because it is consistent with what we've already done. And it's consistent with the realization that, um, that, uh, that, that it's difficult for us to know uh, what it is, uh, it's difficult for us to be any more specific than that at this time. So rather than uh, take a shot at it, why not ask the, 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 the resident experts? That's my proposal. An additional clarification last week in the day or two after the full board meeting uh, on a private email chain, Mark Howard and I um, Howard and I gave inputs into a letter that would be sent to DOT with the full board's pass resolution. 
So one would be to confirm if that letter hasn't gone yet. I know the office team is doing a lot of logistics for these meetings. It's possible that that meeting has already gone to DOT in which it would be a follow-up to reinforce with some of the points you mentioned, or if- I'm pretty, sure it, hasn't, I'm pretty sure it has not gone okay. and that may be on me rather than the district office. There's just been a, a, a lot of other things going on that have- okay. um, that, that then if that's my bad that's my bad well then if, if it hasn't gone then i think working some of these points into that could be a natural way forward that's a great idea and and we could actually even put in what was i think one of the motivating points that do they really need four police officers per block so maybe we could even throw that in there some uh, i'm glad to circulate the draft and, and receive comments great any other hands uh christian well, I want to say I, I like my, Mark's idea, um, and for all those that are saying that people are smart enough to stay away from each other, that is why they close the playgrounds because people were not doing that, and and uh, and some people will do it, but some others some others will not. Uh, Bill. Trying to think of ways to make this work, I still find. Um, challenges. So if the first idea was, you know, closing entire streets, uh, avenues like Broadway, that wouldn't work because it, it would, I feel like it'd feel like a street fair without a shop and it'd be a place for people to kind of hang out or kids to play stickball or whatever kids play nowadays. And, you know, it would, you would inadvertently promote large gatherings, I think. Um, to Julian's point, again, I, I also, I don't have the data to um, make good recommendations as to if we were to do this, where would be the best place? My major concern is just saving people's lives and getting them to hospitals as soon as possible. So if this is something we're seriously considering, I would say we could probably get health and human services involved in this idea, in this resolution, to see what they may know that we're missing out on at this point. Um, and what was my other point? Uh, that's basically it. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Rich? Uh, the, uh, yeah, so I think last month's resolution was very good and needed. And um, we should send it out. And as long as we're making changes that don't change, material change the resolution, um, sending a letter is great. I think in two ways, this what I propose tonight differs from that. Uh, number one is that it calls for an increased number of street closures, which last month's resolution did not do. Uh, number two is that it says that you know, we should be looking at ways that the street closures can take effect without relying on NYPD to enforce them. Uh, I agree with many people who say, like, you know, the, the notification was shit on this and we can't vote on it tonight. Um, having said that, I don't think we should lose a month. So I really think that we need to address this before full board and then be able to vote on it uh, in May full board um, and have a real discussion about it uh, that's properly noticed and that people can join. So I think we, we can't vote on it now uh, and we should do it just before full board. Am I still live? Am I still live? May I speak? Yes, Thank you. absolutely. I am happy to have another meeting about this if that's the will of the, this was a, a joint committee meeting with three committees. And I think that this is right up the alley of all three of those committees. HHS is one of them, by the way. So a point well taken. Um, um, the, um, and, and BCI is, I think, very relevant to the issues mm -hmm. about deliveries and so forth. So if we could find another date for a meeting, and if that's the will of the chairs of those committees, I'm not gonna dictate agendas to anybody, um, then I'd be happy to try to schedule that with, with appropriate notice. What I will not be uh, looking at with a kind eye is a pre-meeting before full board itself. This is, a, this is a discussion that needs more than a half an hour, um, and it needs uh, to be held at an hour at which folks who who knows, maybe by then some of them will be back at work, um, would be able to participate in, um, at which point we can, um, and, and 
uh, at which point we can have the discussion that Rich is talking about, if that's the will of the chairs of the various committees and I leave it in their various hands. Um, I still think we send a letter out tomorrow and I will circulate a draft to, um, to, to get that resolution to the DOT uh, and how much or little of it that relates to this discussion is uh, to be determined by you guys. Uh, Meg, there's a bunch of Q and A's. Do you want to do them or should I? Uh, I've been scrolling through them. Many of them, I think are apologies. Some of them are conversation back and forth and not questions. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are about the public notice issues, which we've covered and apologize for. Some of them are about data or specific measures and expertise of committee members, um, which I think we've addressed. I'm going to keep scanning to see if there are others. Any other comments from the committee or the, uh, the, the other board members? I think um, I'm generally, so I'm in fate, Mark, when you look at the letter that may have not yet gone to DOT with the resolution passed last week, if you look at the uh, your emails with me and Howard and Penny around that, you'll see some language. And if you can um, perhaps while keeping true to the to that resolution more strongly emphasize this piece of it, that could be useful. I'm very open to having an additional uh, three committee meeting. I agree it should not be the same day as full board. That would not be appropriate. Um, I do think, however, we should keep in mind that the level of expertise among the committee members will not necessarily change between now and that meeting. And so any text we may want to vote on at that meeting, um, we should do some thinking about how much time we spend talking about what specifics we may or may not want to recommend when again, DOT would be the experts in this. And so that's something I would like for us to keep in mind in any future discussion and what a future resolution could look like. I agree. If I may answer Jack with another, I ha actually did have one more point that uh, I wanted to bring up. Again, if we did close out some of the streets, we would have our, our neighbors have to relocate some of their vehicles, assuming mm -hmm. they would have to do that. That's added stress to them to kind of leave the Upper West Side or you know, just move to another area. Uh, also with that closure, would also affect our, our cyclists. They may not be able to go to Broadway anymore and have to it's not the end of the world, but that's still a very inconvenient thing for them to do. So just have to relocate and not everyone would be uh, respecting uh, the changes. Um, but if we were to go ahead, I think we should set a time limit on how long we plan on doing this. Um, I do think it'd be very, very difficult to enforce. Um, most of you have mentioned that in Central Park or Riverside Park, people are not doing um, six feet distancing. Um, so I just, I just worry that those behaviors would be moved over to Broadway or whichever street you guys feel is uh, necessary. I think the theory is that if there's more space, people would at least have the opportunity to keep more, more distance uh, between them. Uh, so I just want to be spacious, however. And yeah. you know, if someone's meeting with someone, is, is, is because they want to do it. You know, I think oh, I'm talking about involuntarily. I'm not talking about people who voluntarily get closer than six feet. I'm talking about passing people on the street. Yeah. The wider the street, the more able you are to uh, keep your distance. Uh, Ken? I think, Colleen, I think Colleen wanted to jump in. Oh, I was just going to oh. add to what William just mentioned that keep in mind that, you know, you're looking at DOT to make that decision, but this is also a coordinated effort with NYPD and your district is not the, or your community board is not the only community board that's asking us to look at additional streets in their district. So I think enforcement is gonna play a pivotal role in this as well. So maybe we should have NYPD in our discussion too. Yes, you should. Yeah, I think you should, that's a great idea. Yeah, we'd want them. Uh, Ken? Uh, yeah, although I think the idea is that a lot of cities are doing it without police. Um, the whole idea, to answer William's concerns is that it's uh, it's sort of open only to local traffic. So um, it's sort of like a shared street and it's open to everybody as opposed to just one kind of user because we're used to looking at streets as just being for one kind of user, which is a wheeled user that goes very, very fast. 
Um, and uh, this is a, a different kind of concept. Um, and uh, also just, uh, I, th I agree that uh, I would support having a meeting uh, before the um, uh, full board meeting. And I, I just looked at my jam-packed schedule um, huh. and uh, um, I see that I'm free on the uh, 28th, which is a week before. So I, I'm throwing that out as a suggestion. Barbara? Barbara? Hi. Um, yeah, I don't understand why this, these are the only types of issues that we discuss in this committee. What about uh, trying to get more train service for, or buses for essential workers and people who cannot be socially distant when they're riding in a train or on a bus because they're jam packed? We're not discussing that at all. So that's a great idea. And we encourage, and Elizabeth mentioned some others before, like I really encourage people, if you have issues you want to discuss or specific resolutions you might have in mind related to supporting them, like please bring them forward and suggest them to us. Yeah, uh, Barbara, this is on, wait, this is on the, the well, it was not on the agenda, but it's being discussed tonight because Rich brought it up. He emailed us about this. Feel free to email me and or, or Meg, um, and we'll be happy to put it on. Fine. Um, who else? Anyone else? Okay, uh, Meg, how do you want to proceed with this? Uh, I think it's sounding like people are generally okay with having an additional meeting that has appropriate public notice uh, to discuss what something might, what this might look like. I don't have a specific suggestion uh, for how best to figure out what the date and time of that meeting might be. Um, I don't know when other recently when other committees have scheduled um, changed their sh shifted schedule how they did it if they just did it, you know, and it's three committees. Um, Mark, I don't know if you have any thoughts from that angle. I, I can't speak for them and um, and since we agree that we want some kind of meaningful presence from NYPD. And from yeah. EOT, we'd have to coordinate that. We'll do okay. our. Um, the other thing I want to uh, mention is that we want DOT to participate, but it seems that they will not get on a Zoom call. So we may need a different platform for that meeting. Um, because NYPD? NYPD apparently got the chancellor of the Department of Education's memo and decided that they wouldn't uh, use Zoom anymore either. Um, uh, maybe that'll change by the time we have this meeting because Zoom is working furiously to fix the problems that have been ascribed to it. But anyway, there's a lot of moving parts here. I, I don't think we're in any way ready to say when this meeting is going to take place, although the week before full board is a generally a good week uh, in terms of uh, absence of conflicts, if I can put it that way. Yeah, I just want to say that I think NYPD's participation is critical because one of the big objections that I understand is that it's, it's a big expense and burden on a decimated police force. And I need to understand why they need to have so many police when they don't need police, when there are two ton uh, vehicles shooting down, but they do need police when people are just casually walking down. So it's something I think we need to understand in order to make this, this in order to get shed any light on this issue. I, that's that's a fair point, and and it, the point's been raised in the chat and elsewhere that other cities are able to do this without police. Mm -hmm. I think it behooves all of us to find out how they do it and right. whether that can be replicated here. Uh, I would say that uh, we might uh, work also to invite someone from the mayor's office because the mayor is one of the uh, big opponents of not having police presence. Uh, fair enough. Um, maybe that guy who joined our, our full board meeting, Andrew Kunkis, who's in the community affairs unit, maybe that would be the right guy. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, criticisms on this issue? I'll add in terms of finding the next date, you know, we have Christian here, but we have the other co-chairs of the of both BCI and HHS that are not on this. And so we'll need to link with them about figuring out the timing of that discussion as well. And I recommend the 30th. I uh, have a final to do on the 29th online. Um, so that would be very helpful if I don't have to take two hours of my day on the 28th. Um, personal recommend, personal uh, request. I, I can't do the 30th for personal reasons. We'll, we'll figure out the date.
either way, I'm showing up. <laughs> um, any other questions on that? Well, I noticed, oh, sorry. I no, noticed. Not a question. No, I, I support Mark's suggestion and, and, and having another meeting about this so we can give proper notice and we can be thoughtful. I'll, I'll certainly commit to thinking about this and how, how um, we can it, we can implement it or some ideas. And of course, we're gonna make sure we get the input from the real urban planners and the DOT. And, and, and by the way, just, yeah, NYPD. And by the way, just one other note, and I, this is unrelated to this committee, but I really wanna hear from the NYPD. I have been getting a lot of inquiries about increased crime um, in, this, in the 2-4 and the 2-0. And I, I've said this before at another meeting, besides the Citizen app, which is a non-scientific app, but I do listen to the local precinct from time to time. And uh, there, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of petty crime. Um, and I'm concerned. I'd like to hear from the NYPD as to what's going on in our neighborhood crime-wise. May I address that please, for one quick second? Yes, please. Um, Doug, uh, I'm not sure if you and I had this conversation or it just Penny was that smart. But Penny is already in contact with both precinct commanders. Um, the informal response she got is that while it may feel like crime is up, the statistics don't bear it out, but the request has been made by the community board to the precinct commanders to uh, come up with an update on this very issue, which we propose to then put on our website. Uh, one of the things that we didn't have time for last week at full board was a more generalized greeting and statement from the two precinct commanders. Um, to the to the community and how they're working in this time and um, and and we're, we're going to get that up on the website. Um, but then the idea is that we've asked them to for a further update, especially with that particular issue in mind. So um, uh, you're either inspired uh, tele tele telegraphically or whatever, but it, it, that 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 issue is being worked on. Just to say, Doug, that um, I think the statistics actually show crime is down pretty significantly. Uh, well, I have to, first of all, I've spoken to a couple of the managers at CVS and Dwayne Reed, and one of the reasons that they're no longer 24 hours, besides the fact that they were low in staffing and want to restock, is because they were having a disproportionate amount of petty crime. People were walking in and stealing $999 worth of stuff, <laughs> is below the bail limit, mm -hmm. and they had an increase. One of the reasons they closed the stores earlier is because of the petty crime. That's not necessarily violent crime, but it's still a problem. But Doug, I think that, that's been a problem for more than a year, as far as I know. Well, well and, yeah. and part of it is that they, 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 they solved the problem by hiring security, which who are now among the people who can't get to work. Um, I want to just offer, uh, I'm sorry to take your time on this, uh, but a very quick moment that the HHS committee had a very interesting uh, meeting last night with domestic violence um, experts. And the concern there is that the crime that isn't being reported because it's hard to report domestic violence when you're sheltering in place with your abuser, um, that there is an expectation that there will be an uptick in those reports as soon as this uh, crisis is over. Um, it is something that, um, anyway, it obviously tugs at my heart uh, and I'm sure at all of yours too. Um, and that that's something that um, there are uh, a continuing dialogue about as well. So crime statistics are, are an interesting animal. And that's one of the ones, one of the ways in which we ought to be mindful of it. And I'm grateful the HHS committee uh, did that work. Any other I questions? A, oh, yeah. I had a question for a couple of questions for Colleen before, in case she's about to run, run out. <laughs> I can't run, I'm in my living room. <laughs> <laughs> On this or other issues? Um, on two other issues. Okay, sure. and any other things to close out the other? No. We'll save it. All right, we'll follow up with everyone um, about scheduling otherwise. Go ahead, Ken. Okay, uh, Colleen, can you tell us um, what the status is given the health emergency with and the reduced manpower and budget um, with the extension of uh, completion of Central Park West? and uh, also give us an update on the uh, Cross Park uh, uh, Task Force. Uh. Yeah. yeah, well, um, as you know, there have been, um, you know, with what we've experiencing is um, the, our staff is on rotational basis. There's been um, a lot of us are teleworking from home 
as you can imagine, just like most of you are as well. I know that Central Park West, we are determined to move forward with that and continue with the implementation. Uh, once we get back, um, my colleagues were having a conversation today about the timeline. So I will keep the community board posted on it, but that's a project that we do not want to put in the back burner. We wanna continue with finishing it off for this year as what we proposed. A lot of our SIPS projects, which is our safety improvement projects, they might have to be implemented next year. We're not sure yet. We're gonna prioritize the most important ones. In terms of the, uh, the uh, Central Park um, discussion that we've had, we, we were in the midst of you know, having meetings and we only had one meeting, which was with the Conservancy and with Parks. And then COVID came, you know, and um, we haven't had a discussion about it, but I will find out where we are and what um, next steps would be when we go back um, to the office and uh, see what 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 is next. Um, but just to let you know, I know the, the main thing is um, the transverses and of course with the continuation of the uh, Central Park West bike lane. So that is, you know, still on target, just so you know. So all, all this has to wait for the office to open up again? The office is open up, but we're speaking with our contractors to see what the schedule is gonna to be to complete the, the timeline for the uh, bike lane. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, but I, I can't give you, I cannot, I, I cannot give you an answer regarding the transverse right now. I can't, because mm -hmm. I don't know where we are. Uh, and you raised a really good question in terms of budget, how a lot of our projects are gonna be affected with you know, budget cuts and constraints. At the moment, I, I don't know because we have to sit with our, um, our capital division, capital projects division to see where we can prioritize certain projects then take from that and implement to, into others as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I just wanted to point out that the Dr. Kammerman who was killed uh, on the transfers was going to his job at Mount Sinai. And now we have many, many more frontline workers uh, cr I'm crossing the park uh, um, to get to uh, you know, the front lines of Mount Sinai. Um, and uh, so, um, you know, I think, you know, yeah. we're, it's, we're an, not, it's an urgent situation too. Yeah. And it's it's not just the transverses, the um, the idea of the task force was to look at all the all the uh, options, mm -hmm. and, uh, including the surface paths. And as far as I know, nothing has happened with the surface paths, mm -hmm. nothing. What Rich put down is some of the low-hanging fruit in our resolution. Yeah, it's, you're right. Nothing has happened. And again, because of the constraints that we're faced with right now. And our staffs are rotational. We don't have that many people working out there on, on the streets. We really don't, not at the moment. Any other questions for Colleen? If I could just reinforce, uh, we did list a lot of real low hanging fruit, even putting up signs, just uh, telling cyclists where they can go and completely understood that there are so many other uh, urgent priorities and short staff and everything. But mm -hmm. I think there are some, some easy fixes uh, that could make things safer, especially for the first responders who are crossing the park. Agreed. Okay. Anything else? Any other um, new business? Old business? Other thoughts? So we're going to have to schedule a meeting um, for which we will give appropriate notice on this issue of pedestrianizing more public space. I hope to God that this need uh, abates uh, relatively quickly, but <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't bet on it. So we're going to go ahead and, and uh, try to schedule the meeting. And um, if there's nothing else, I guess uh, the, the meeting is adjourned. Anything else? Thank you all. OK, thank, thank you. you all. Stay safe. Be well. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, guys. Take care. Be safe. Especially. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe.